All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Glad to be here. This is John, and I am joined by Ernie uh, from Harbinger the Harvest, as well as Jason uh, Malden. Is that correct how you say it, Jason? That's right. Jason is a brother that we're going to have share with us tonight about uh, some of his experience sharing the Mandela Effect story. Uh, it appears as though God has given him some wisdom or a special grace to uh, be a little bit more effective than the ma majority of us. So um, we're going to turn him loose here in just a moment. Um, but I would just like to open in prayer because this is a, a spiritual phenomenon. It is a mystery. It's a sign and wonder that was prophesied. And we really uh, find it to be uh, something that's driving us back to God from the idolatry that many of us have fallen into in trying to search the scriptures for in them, we thought we would find eternal life. Um, never thought I was a Pharisee until the Mandela effect happened. So, Father, we just humbly just bow our heads tonight and invoke your name. We thank you for your word that you gave to the original patriarchs, the original autographs, which were written on parchments and then were passed down. And they were written on our hearts. And uh, now as we find ourselves in this time in history, Father, we just look up. Our gaze looks up to you, the author and finisher of our faith. And we just ask you for wisdom. We ask you for the spirit of truth to just slather all over this live stream, Father God. We thank you for the spirit of truth that if we're deceived, that if we are in error and we are been led astray, God, that we ask you to send brothers and sisters to us to open our eyes and to lead us out of this deception. But if you have given us a revelation and opened our eyes, we ask you to give us wisdom on how we can share this with others so that they may see. And Father, and we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and awesome. Amen. All right. Well, we are super excited tonight to be here with um, Ernie and Jason. Ernie actually... Uh, told me about Jason and said that he was having incredible results with this topic, which, as we all know, is a very difficult topic to share <laughs> with people. I mean, normally, you know, intelligent, mild-mannered people will erupt in like a volcano of anger as they realize what you're telling them. Uh, they will immediately change the subject. They will dismiss it as foolishness and change the subject. It's just almost more astonishing than the Mandela effect itself. The reaction of the loved ones and especially church leaders. And so what we are here tonight to find out is, uh, you know, a key. Sometimes 80% of the difference comes from 20% of the things that you do or know. And so we're just asking God to help us hear from Jason. What are some of the things that God has shown him that helps him uh, get the kind of results that he's getting? So, Jason, welcome to uh, Real Church. We're here every Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern. And uh, looking forward to just hearing from you, brother. Why don't you just greet the, greet the community and um, just give us a little snapshot of your journey, how you came to see the changes, and then some of the things that you've shared with us um, of what you've been able to accomplish because it's pretty astonishing. All right. Well, John, I really appreciate being here. Um, it's really exciting to um, to be a part of the community and to get back in a little bit. Um, I think it was back in 2018. I spent some time in the Hangouts with EYA and with Kat. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, my journey in, with the Mandela Effect and seeing the Bible changes started October 13th of 2017. So it took took a few months of um, trying to get my feet underneath me after that and figure out, you know, how to connect with community. And it was um, great to be able to talk to Kat and with and I met Ernie sir, sir, um, shortly after that. So it was really nice to um, to have a community of, of believers that were, you know, we could <laughs> we could try to figure this thing out and to yeah. um, gain some balance because, man, um, Talk about a destabilizing experience potentially for a lot of folks. 
You know, and and I'm just going to go ahead and mention right now, you know, I think that one of the the most uh, profound uh, things that I started to see um, when I was having conversations with folks early on is I would say a lot of believers, you know, it's, it's just amazing to say this, but a lot of them just really don't believe in the supernatural, mm -hmm. um, don't really believe in miracles um, that are modern day and you start talking to somebody about something that they can't touch and feel and make sense out of and, you know, like wrap their mind around it in a very logical way, then most of these people are just out of the conversation. So, um, you know, that was a real eye opener for me because I felt that, you know, people that are believers and really understand scriptures, you know, should understand the spiritual nature of this world that, you know, um, that we are subject to the spirit world. And that God, you know, was he created, you know, this creation is subject to the spiritual realm first. And I think most believers and most Christians just um, they only see what, you know, they're learning in school and a lot of very logically based and and really only understand um, things from a natural perspective. You know, they're thinking in terms of bank accounts and, you know, homes and um, you know, just fitting into the world and not really seeing this from a, a spiritual perspective first. So that's something that I had to overcome, you know, in 2017, into 2017, 2018, um, the amount of resistance, because I thought, wow, all I have to do is just start telling some of these people about this. And they're going <laughs> to get right away, just like all of us. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So um, so it'd probably be helpful for me to just, you know, to share with everybody who doesn't know me, um, you know, just my story started back in, you know, I'm 51 years old. So in 2000 or excuse me, 1985, I got born again at 14 years old and I did not come from a religious background. Um, I had godly parents, more, you know, um, biblical principles were being in operation in our home but not really in church. So um, when I had a friend of mine that introduced me to the Lord um, at a Christian concert of all things, he asked me if I'd come. Um, he asked me about, you know, if I, he said, you're one of the, the, the nicest guys I know, good guy, but you don't know the Lord. Do you want to know him? I'm like, absolutely. So my experience in that moment was profound. I mean, you know, like the Lord came into my life and I knew I was changed forever. There was a, a fork in the road and I had taken the right fork. And over the next few months, I really dug into the scriptures myself. I didn't want to know what church or what religion was going to tell me. I wanted to know what was in the Bible first and then, you know, start hearing from pastors, teachers, um, but I wanted to know for myself. So th there was a real journey for truth that I was on even early on. Mm -hmm. And I think that made a big difference um, into you know my foundation. Um, it wasn't just suggestions that people were telling me in church. Uh, I felt like I had a, a very deep relationship with the Lord and he was giving me instructions and guidelines in the scriptures. And I really did take them into my heart early. So that was my foundation piece. And I can still remember that one of the in, in my studies of the scripture, I, I really took to heart that there would be a strong delusion, that there would be uh, a great deception that would be happening at some point. So for me, I've always kind of had my eyes open and I really thought it would be someone, you know, maybe somebody I knew in the church that would come to me and say, hey, Jason, there's some things that are going on that you don't know about. Most people don't know, but let me just tell you about it. Um, I had no idea I was going to be that guy, <laughs> you know, like in the church, watching for people to be able to talk to and to say, hey, look, there's something going on, you know, and I'm seeing some things that are very um, supernatural in nature. And I feel like I'm, you know, I'm seeing things that are very true. I'm, I'm searching for truth. I'm searching for, for God's direction and all this. And hey, can you listen to what I'm what I have to say and then give me your perspective? So, you know, I was already looking for it and I was in the gym um, one day listening to a YouTube. Um, I was just kind of flipping through some YouTube feeds that had come up on my or, you know, just channels that come up on my feed. And one of them was talking about um, the Bible being changed. And let me back up for just a second. My daughter at the time, she was 14 years old and she had asked me one day, um, I was driving her to school, did I know about the Mandela effect? It's like, what are you talking about? And she said, well, 
you know, there's some things that are different than what people remember. And I was like, so, so like, give me an example. And she said, um, oh, she gave me the Berenstein Bears, I think was one of them. And, um, oh, and also Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. Like those yep. were the, the, and I was like, well, yes, it was Berenstein, um, not Stain. And that, and I can tell you for sure, I was a kid that watched Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. So it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Um, you know, was absolutely, you know, and, and she said, no, now it's, it's a beautiful day. What in this neighborhood? Um, I think it is now. Yeah. Um, exactly. so I was like, no, that's not right. And I kept in the back of my mind. I was like, okay, I'm going to put a pin on this. Um, I don't, I didn't really go dig into it, but I was mm -hmm. like watching and it was a few months later that feed came up and it said that the Bible, you know, had, you know, people that know the Bible are saying the Bible had changed. I'm like, well, I'm going to know right away if this is true or not. So, of course, it was the lion lays down with the lamb. And, I, you know, all the alarm bells went off. I know exactly where I was standing when I saw that. And I'm like, OK, it's here. Like this deception, this thing that I've been watching for, like, wow, um, you know, just chills went through me. And um, and I knew in that moment that um, that my world had just shifted, you know, that now it was go time. All right, so let me just interrupt you here for a second. I just mm -hmm. want to make sure I understand your testimony. What you're saying is you had a setup from the Holy Spirit, sort of a premonition that you were a, like sort of a watchman on deck, if I could say it like that. You were coming into the body of Christ, but immediately felt like you kind of knew something was coming around the corner. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah. And I think that goes for a couple of things. One thing, um, like I didn't know anyone you know, in the community that I was in, I didn't know anyone that was homosexual. So when I was talking to a buddy of mine and he knew a little bit more about scripture and of course we're wanting to get into some sensational stuff. We're looking at the, um, with the prophets, we're looking through revelation and we were trying to imagine what it might look like for things in the revelation to, to kind of play out for for gender to be such a big issue. And, you know, um, so I knew then, and we were talking about like what this might look like if we were living in the last days and we had these conversations around it. And so not only was I paying attention to that, but I was paying attention to the strong delusion piece, which, you know, if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. Mm -hmm. So I knew that this was something that I needed to keep my eyes open for because, you know, I just believe scripture. I, I believe that this was possible. So I'm just waiting for it to happen. That's a significant observation also that you were you were trafficking in in philosophical type thinking. So you're you're descending below the superficial type yeah. of standard convos among Christians, you know, and you were thinking end time prophecy. <laughs> this is outside the purview of a lot of people. They just aren't interested. It isn't on their grill. And so that's a characteristic, I believe, that's an important part of a truther's mindset, that right. they have this eye to the supernatural. They're looking for it like you were. So go ahead. That's that's a great insight. Go ahead. Yeah. So Second Thessalonians 2 um, immediately is where I was I was going to, um, you know, lovers of God, lovers of truth, you know, was a, a big um, theme for me. I felt like Holy Spirit was just leading me in that direction. And, you know, it's also very interesting. I can remember a couple of months before all this came about, I guess it must have been, you know, in the summer of 2017. Um, I remember sitting on my couch and I had my Bible out and, you know, there was some other things that I've been studying a bit. And I remember praying, you know, God, I am so interested in truth. Like, I, I, I don't <laughs> care what it is, you know, like, I want to know it, you know, so you know, hit me with your best shot. Like, I want to be the, one of the people that you trust with more information than, than just the average person knows. So, um, you know, I know that was prompted by the spirit to continue to, to prepare me for um, for the direction he was taking. me. That's another important re revelation is truthers yeah. want the truth at any cost. Wherever it takes me, I will go. Whatever it costs me, I will mm -hmm. take it. So that's another important aspect of people that see. Thank you for sharing yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I guess I'll just go ahead and go forward from, you know, after I'd seen it, um, you know, I, here I am in a situation, it was a Thursday and I'm, I'm thinking, okay, right, well, actually 
that was the 12th that I became aware of this because I remember it was Friday the 13th. Um, this was a Thursday and uh, I had some friends of mine. Uh, we, we were meeting with a small group of, of guys or well, not just guys. Um, we had about six or seven people that met together on Thursday nights as a, as a support group. We've been meeting for about 10 years. So I knew that a, a couple that, that came was somebody I wanted to run this by right away. Well, it just so happened that at the office, I also had a guy that was here that um, had been a missionary um, for several years, um, South America, and he's currently a teacher and he was here. And I said, look, you know, I got a, a crazy conversation I want to have with you, but <laughs> would it be all right if we, you know, just talked about some real serious you know, topics for a bit? And he's like, yeah. So I stood and talked with him um, just kind of been passing for about 20 minutes. We were, you know, basically standing in a small room and um, and I, I described, you know, what I had just heard and just wanted to get his feedback on it. And he said, Jason, I know that it was the lion lays down with the lamb. And I brought up a couple other little things and he's like, yeah, I said, I don't, I can't explain it, but you're, you're absolutely right. You know, um, because I told him, look, I just want to know your perspective on this um, because I may be on, on the, um, you know, on the ledge here. So when my other two friends came that I told them to come on in a little bit early, I need to talk to you. Um, and they came in. So I, I said, look, I need to sit down with you guys and explain, you know, what I'm seeing right now, because I'm depending on you to reel me back in if I'm, if I'm out there. So I explained to them, and I guess it was more like a 30 minute conversation, if I remember it right, initially, and uh, no, it was a little bit longer than that, come to think of it, because I think um, it was just us for that night. And they said the same thing, like, I have no idea what's going on, but everything you're telling me is right. And, you know, we don't don't know the answers here. And and then I have to, I'm thinking, OK, now my wife, I've got to talk to my wife about this. So I didn't go home and talk to her that night, but I told her, I've got to talk to you in the morning. We've got to sit down and have a long conversation. <laughs> so we had a two hour conversation on Friday morning and she um, initially was incredibly skeptical. Like, you know, I don't see how this could be possible. Um, you know, a little bit of fear in her eyes, but also she's a researcher. She's somebody that wants to get to the bottom of things. And um, I still remember that day very clearly. I was um, I had a lot of work to do. I was staying busy. But boy, did I keep this going in my mind. I started looking through YouTube channels. And fortunately, Cat with EYA, you know, had a bunch um, at that time that were really short, that were hitting on a bunch of different scriptures. And I was like, mm -hmm. yep, yep, yep. Every time I listen to one, I'm like, OK, you know, this is really happening. And like all of us, I think, you know, it's just this surreal feeling like here we are in this in this different phase of life, you know, now it's go time. It's, it really is happening here. And, um, and I had to work really late that night. I was going to be out. Um, you know, I had a, a job that was keeping me out late and I ended up calling and talking to my wife a couple of times and she, and she, she secluded herself for a while. I mean, she was just researching yeah. and digging and pulling out Bibles. And she said, yep, this is happening. You know, I see it. So I, right. I can't tell you how, uh, John, I know your story. A little bit, so Hold um, on a second, man. <laughs> you got to hold on a second. Is right. it just me? You guys, is it just me? Or is this guy like batting a thousand right out of the gate? And I'm going out there and just banging my head against the wall. Okay. So what I perceive is that you have a special grace that God has given you. That you have a special grace that will be transferred to us tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. And so, because from listening to you, there's nothing special about your presentation or these <laughs> relationships that you have with these people. Yeah. And there, there are special graces that God gives people. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and thank God for it. And so go yeah. ahead. Yeah. So, um, Okay, so I am going to pull out, you know, what I started doing, uh, I really believe the Lord led me to, um, you know, I knew how significant this was. So I wanted to start taking, um, like uh, creating a log, a, a list of all the people that I wanted to talk to. And I started putting together kind of my own presentation. Mm -hmm. 
you know, it's I started to realize there is kind of a, a way that I um, unfold this information. Um, first of all, I point the finger at myself and not at them. Um, I'm not trying to convince the person that I'm telling about this, um, especially early on. You know, the first six or eight people I talked to, it was presented in such a way that I said, look, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm experiencing. And I need you as a fellow believer to help me to make sure that I'm not getting into error. Yeah. So, um, so I explained based on, you know, what my perceptions were and, you know, what I was seeing. And I started off as gently as possible, which I don't, you know, there's not really an easy way to, to get into any of this. Um, but I, the premise was, first of all, the people that I'm talking to, okay, there's a few criteria here. First of all, I've known them for a long time. Mm -hmm. Another criteria is these these people have been in a long walk with the Lord, 20 years plus. Um, so, you know, very stable, very mature believers. So, uh, you know, that I feel like is very important. And, you know, now what I'm realizing is these people already understood the spiritual nature of life, you know, that there is, um, you know, the miracles happen, that, you know, the spirit world is real and that it's so many things can happen outside of our, our understanding. Yeah. Um, so just being open and, and willing to listen, you know, I think was just part of uh, the, the makeup of a lot of the people that I was talking to, especially early on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I ended up having this list and working off of it and I ended up find um, I found that it was about a two hour conversation I was having with folks. Um, and it started with um, my conversation with my daughter that told me about the Mandela effect. And I wanted to know if they had heard of it because my daughter was asking me and I'd never heard of it. Um, and I explained to them the uh, Mr. Rogers neighborhood. And then I came up with a list and, you know, it's probably about 30 or 40 different Mandela effects that I was aware of at the time. And and just said, hey, let me just run through some of these um, with you just so you can understand what's happening here you know, what I'm seeing. And I think that, you know, I had to give them some space and some time to like, wow, okay. You know, like this is hard to understand, but I get what you're saying. And then shifting over um, to, you know, the logos, um, you know, things like that. And then when we shifted into the spiritual part, um, I started my conversation with basically how I started this one, you know, saying, look, you know, as a, as a teenager, I felt like there would be a great deception that we would be a part of, you know, strong delusion that we're going to have to keep our eyes open for. And I believe this may be it, you know, because this is something that's getting under the radar and people just don't see it. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> then getting into, you know, especially, you know, lion lays down with the lamb. Um, now his wolf dwells with the lamb um, fundamentally different um, and, and getting into just, all the different scripture changes. And I found that literally, I think it's like the first dozen people that I talked to um, truly got it. And quite a few of those people. And I think there was about, I think we had uh, um, 10 or 12 people that, was, that started meeting on Monday nights. Um, wasn't long after that where we wanted to sit in a circle um, and have conversations. And at that time, we, we were also like blown away by what was going on that we even made sure that all the cell phones were out in the cars. Like we were going to have these conversations that were not going to be recorded and that we were going to be very careful about, you know, like this deciding what what's happening right now and what to do with this information, like what, you know, and praying, you know, spending time, you know, asking the Lord, what does this mean? What does this mean for each one of us? And what is our responsibility at this time now knowing what we know? So, you know, that's how things started with me. And I would say now, um, you know, for the first couple of years, I talked to a lot of folks. The number got to be over 50 that I'd had that conversation with. So, you know, you multiply out the time that I've sat with those people, just the initial conversations, um, a lot of time. Um, and a lot of these people I'd already known for 10, 20, 30 years. Um, you know, the first ones that I was talking to, especially. And, um, and then I started mixing in some pastors and only took a couple of months. And I was like, okay, I've got to, to really, you know, go to some of the pastors that I know and also some that are in my area that I just want to talk to. Um, and, 
you know, and find out, you know, just what is God doing right now? What is he sharing with others? You know, what what's going to be this game plan? And I was picturing, you know, maybe an underground church or maybe now it's just going to be, um, you know, like out there and certain churches are going to be aware of it and certain ones maybe not. But had no idea at that point. I'm still surprised that like no churches that I'm aware of are are preaching and, you know, acknowledging the Bible changes. So, you know, that just it, it didn't materialize. Hasn't yet. Say that again, what you just said. Yep. So the um, it, it surprised me that the churches were not, you know, the, the pastors in particular were not aware of what was happening and and preaching the truth on this subject, you know, um, acknowledging Bible changes. Still haven't seen that happen in my community, of course. And even after having conversations with several of them that early on in the conversations, they absolutely agreed. And, you know, I watched, you know, one man in particular who had a um, congregation of probably several hundred, um, could be more than that, probably maybe about 500, um, have a very difficult time. Absolutely. You know, he's, he's like, yes, I know it was a lion lays down with the lamb. We talked about other scriptures and we had a good two hour conversation in my office and he's asking me, what do I do with this information? You know, like what now? And I'm like, pastor, I don't have any answers for you. You know, um, I know that the Lord's put this on my heart and I'm aware of it. And, you know, this, there's a journey ahead of us, but I'm not sure what this is going to look like. Um, and I said, but just know I'm going to be praying for you and I'm, I'm here to help, um, you know, and let's have more conversations about this because there's a lot of people I know that can, you know, help you with, with the journey, with what we're seeing. So, so he came I, back. I have a question in all of these interactions. Are you aware of any of these pastors that have accepted and acknowledged this is happening and then brought it to their congregation eventually? Not aware of that. Mm -mm. And how many pastors do you think that you talked to that did acknowledge that that was changing to you? Um, when I see, I would say there were six pastors that I can remember right now that I talked to. One was a couple. Um, and I would say all but one was tracking with me in the conversation. Okay. All right. And then the one basically said, Jason, you're missing it. And then it was interesting right after the conversation, he's walking me outside. Now this was the assistant pastor of a big church that I'd been a part of for a while. Yeah. Um, as we're walking out, he's telling me, you know, my dad, you know, like I know where you're coming from. You get this information on YouTube. My dad, yeah. you know, he's all about these chemtrails and, you know, I keep telling him, dad, you can't just get your information from anywhere. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so he doesn't, He's not aware of any level of truth and and wanting to hear anything, even from his father. So I knew it was a closed door with him. He was not interested in hearing from me at all. And what do you think the different mechanisms are that cause pastors to react that way? Yeah. All right. So, <clears throat> <laughs> you know, we've all I think we all asked that question. Um you know, John, I've got to be, I, you know, the perspective that I come from might be a little bit different here. You know, my my perspective is that, um, let's see how to word this. Well, let's back up a little bit. You know, in life, what I what I do for a living is, you know, God's given me the opportunity to to be a life coach and to work with individuals. So I sit each day and I work with, um, you know, probably four or five different individuals and we're working through life issues. And, you know, so I get a lot of different people that come through um, that I'm working with. And I believe God's given me the grace to uh, to really allow someone to have their own journey. You know, when when they're explaining what's going on in their life, um, I am I'm very open to the fact that they haven't seen certain things and that there are you know, parts of their journey that's still ahead of them. Maybe they've done things that I haven't done, you know, or, you know, see or further along in their journey than I am. But ultimately, each one of us has a journey in life that the, that the Lord has put us on. And when I'm speaking to these pastors and and they're shutting down, not going in that direction, 
Um, my personal experience has not been to be very adversarial with them or to like try to convince them past that point. I'm then saying, okay, I did my part and Holy Spirit, you're going to have to do you know, the rest. And if there's something else that I can do with this person, let me know. So to answer the question, you know, I really feel like that there are, are people, you know, believers that just aren't in a place in their journey where they can see this or accept it. So, you know, I, we're all dealing with this. You know, we would love for the people around us to see it. We would love for pastors to see it. But for whatever reason, you know, and I can't believe that all the pastors that don't see this are just, um, you know, they don't hear from God or that they're, you know, going to hell, you know, something like that. My position would be that they're in their journey and they have not gotten to the place where they're able to see or recognize this. So that would be my answer to that. And I just, I, you know, I, I give grace to people with where they are. Um, yeah. And I would love for them to know the truth, but there's a lot of things that, you know, I go through life and see that people don't see the truth. We're in the health industry, you know, seeing people get well naturally. And, you know, when people are taking all the medications and pharmaceuticals and having them cut out of their body, I know they're not, there's levels of truth they're really missing. But at the same time, I'm allowing them to be where they are, you know, without judgment. That's a great, great point. I totally receive that. Uh, I know Ernie and I have talked a lot about the idea that pastors would see this and then they would, you know, look for some of us in this community to help shorten their learning curve and support them. And we've talked about what would a pastor really do, like if he was totally committed and Ernie suggested, well, Ernie, just share what you told me about how pastors might bring this to their congregation. Yeah, because, you know, I, I thought about this a lot, uh, or, you know, early on when I started first talk to my pastor and uh, I've actually uh, two of my elders, you know, I've talked to do see and acknowledge the changes. And I'm very disappointed that they have taken no initiatives to like uh, say we need to bring Ernie in for an elders meeting. He's got something to tell you or anything like that. But to answer your question, um, my thought was. Like I say, you just can't stand up there on Sunday morning from the pulpit and just throw this out there and just drop this bomb on everybody. So yeah. my thinking was, you know, you go to your leadership, you talk to your elders, you have a meeting with somebody that, you know, is well versed in this, like one of us, for example, uh, present the information to the eldership, um, have discussions, get them on board, and then they could uh, disseminate it to their family. And then you have uh, you know, the way my church is structured, you have elders and then you have deacons that have certain responsibilities. And then you would roll it out to the deacons, you know, have meetings with them and explain it to them. And uh, then eventually, you know, start having uh, an adult class or something like that. You know, and of course, by this time, it would start spreading to the congregation because the husbands would tell their wives, they would tell their friends. So it would slowly you know, percolate its way through the congregation. And then at some point, whenever you knew that the, you'd reached a critical mass of people that were aware, well, then, you know, perhaps the pastor could stand up there and, uh, you know, give a sermon about it or, you know, have a special class or something like that. So that's kind of the way that, you know, that I thought would probably be the, maybe the most effective or easiest way. Because like I say, you just can't jump up there on Sunday morning and throw this out yeah. there because half your church or more wouldn't show up again. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm an idealist. You know, I just believe the best in people and that they are going to embrace the truth no matter what the cost. But it, your experience and mine are very similar where there's too many agendas in their way to make the leap and there's too much at stake. They'll lose, you know, the ministry that they've created over 25, 30 years. They'll lose the good faith in the community. And it's just too much of a cost. And uh, I don't know. I just, I'm going to keep fighting this because it's so, it's so pertinent. And what I do believe is we've turned the corner now to where the perversions, the, the scriptural perversions, talking about sexual stuff and really outrageous doctrine is getting so prolific that I've changed my approach now. Instead of trying to convince people by showing them, asking them, what do you remember? And then I'm relying on their integrity 
to to respond to this inner knowing, right? That, oh yes, I'm misremembering the line in the lamp. That means the Bible's changing. They're not making that leap as well. But if I show them that there's female angels and God is shaving the vaginas of women and the men are in a bed together and Jesus has female breasts and Jesus is chopping people's heads off and they go to the Bible thinking, oh, this guy's nuts and he's a liar. I'll, I'll, I just got to clear this up. And the passage that I quote is actually saying that. And that's the first time they're seeing it. And the doctrine is so egregious. Then they go, well, I'll clear this up. I'll go to the commentary and the concordance and I'll find out what it really means. And the concordance is verifying, saying what it's saying in the English. They can't say I'm misremembering. So God has his velvet glove, and, and he also has his Samson's, his bulls in a china shop with PowerPoints and sales techniques. Right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. God has his many, many colors that he paints with. That's so. right. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it's not like we've made a few attempts uh, to reach the pastors in this community. I mean, Jason and I, along with Kat, back in 2018, we did a, an entire series of videos which we directed at pastors. Um, so, I mean, you know, this has kind of been laid on, you know, our shoulders and everybody that knows about this, that it's kind of our responsibility to bring it to the church because if we don't tell them, you know, how are they going to find out? So thank you. Thank you for saying that. Could you, could you both address that? Um, that is a topic that is kind of moving through our community. Should we be voicing this concern? The The idea is that we're only making it worse by talking about it. Yeah. Most of us feel a very sincere uh, responsibility. I, I mean, it's obviously a conspiracy. The, this, this phenomenon is purposely subtle so that it flies under the radar and it brings people down this slippery slope into a doctrinal situation where they're going to be able to accept the Antichrist when he comes on the scene. So that's the conspiracy. Well, if you decide that you're smarter than God and you're going to keep quiet about it so that you don't make people backslide, then you become a co-conspirator. You're, you're basically joining ranks with the deceiver instead of sounding the alarm, being a watchman, and letting God deal with the people's reaction. All right? So what's your thoughts on that whole topic? Yeah, Either, let me either. jump. I'll jump in there on that one because yeah. the thing is, I mean, most of us, I mean, it's like what Jason said. Whenever he saw the changes in the Bible, he's like, okay, it's go time. It's here. You know, I'm, yes. I'm like Jason. Since my early 20s, I was into prophecy and felt like that I was living in the last days. And whenever I saw the Bible changes, it was the same reaction. I'm like, okay, we're, we're here. And the thing is, if people, for example, um, let's see what word I want to use. The um, Jabiru, okay, <laughs> when that came out, everyone in our community knew that this was bad news and to stay away from it. And why yeah. is that? Because we see the changes of the Bible and we're aware that we're in the last days. So when we saw something like this, I think I think most of us in our spirit, we knew that this was the wrong thing to be doing. So, but then again, I go to, there's a lot of people in my church that I go to that have taken it, okay? Nothing was said, you know, either for or against, but the thing is, and, and the point I'm getting to is that's the reason why we should be doing this is to wake people up and get them to understand that we are living in the last days and to be aware of these things. Because if you're not aware and if you think everything is just, you know, normal, everyday business as usual, you're going to be deceived. Like a lot yeah. of people have already been deceived in doing something. they Most of them wish they hadn't have done it. I don't know anybody that didn't take it that wish they had, but there's a lot of people that took it that wish they didn't. And I think the next iteration of this thing is going to be probably it. So I think that's the reason why we need to be sounding alarm. It's the reasons why it's important. I understand people say, well, yeah, you cause people may lose their faith or fall away or whatever. Yeah, but, you know, the truth is the truth. OK, and we're to speak the truth. 
And if people know the truth, you know, they should take that to God, pray about it, and let the Holy Spirit let them know what to do. But to withhold the truth and leave them out there in the dark, that's not a place I want to be. I, I, I don't want to be standing in front of Jesus, you know, whenever I'm going through my life review. And he goes, uh, well, you knew about this, but, well, you know, why didn't you share this with people? Matter of fact, I even feel like it's going to be like, well, why didn't you share it with more people? You know? Right. So. That's my position on it and why I think it's important that people under know that it's being changed and understand it so that they don't fall for the great deception. That they don't wind so you, up taking the mark of the beast. You you feel like the church's silence was an abdication of their responsibility and that they were complicit in people taking the shot because they said nothing? I think it's an abdication of their responsibility. I don't know if I would go so far as complicit, but I don't think... I mean, I think we're in the situation we're in because the church hasn't been doing its job for a long time. I mean, we have abortion. We have abominations that are approved of in this country. I mean, the church hasn't been doing its job. And I think that's why we're at where we're at now. I think that's yeah. why we're facing these judgments. So, yes, I do believe that they failed in their job to to warn the people of, of the next thing coming down the line. Mm -hmm. So, Jason, you <clears throat> you made a list. It was a, a purposeful approach you prepared your talk kind of created an outline it sounds like and mm -hmm. then um you began to reach out to people but <clears throat> your your premise was hey i could be wrong but i'm hoping you can take a look at this and tell me where i'm missing it and that's very disarming i could totally respect yeah. that and i do that same thing with folks. Well, and that's that's where I was, especially early on, you know, with the first dozen or so people that I talked to. Then it started to change a little bit in, the, in my delivery where I'm saying, hey, this is something that I'm seeing. And I, you know, like this is my perspective on this. And I'd like to get your perspective on it. Yeah. It stopped being that I'm not sure about this and, and telling them that, hey, I am sure about. This. Yeah, it's a little disingenuous, right? If you're saying yeah. I'm not sure, that's a good point. Yeah, early on, I wasn't, you know, I'm I really was, um, you know, acknowledging the possibility that I am somehow missing the boat. And yeah. I feel like that, you know, we should as believers have the kind of support structure and people that we can go to like Ernie and other elders that he went to. And, you know, I, I think that we should all have people in our lives that we can trust, even if we don't see something, you know, it's, it's very typical for people to have things in their own life that they can't see, but other people see it clearly. So yeah. to have that kind of dialogue and those kind of people in your life is really important. So as you kind of went down the list, tell us, uh, describe, some of the interactions that you had that went well and some that didn't go well, maybe what you, the takeaways, because I know I'm learning every time I do another interaction, I learn a whole bunch of things. So maybe mm -hmm. you could just share some of the things you learned and you guys talk. I'll be back in one second. Sure. So <clears throat> what I found was interesting. And you know, like I said, there was a pastor that I talked to pretty early on and he was completely resistant the whole time. Um, I could tell about 15 minutes into the conversation that he just wasn't getting it. So for him, I knew that I was going to have a really difficult time. Now, um, I, maybe I, I picked some people that I felt like where I was going to have a much easier time with after that. So I had a lot of um, success. I would say probably 15 or 20 different people that I had a lot of success with. And one of the, the, um, the great successes I had early on, and I'm so grateful for this too, is my wife's parents. You know, when I went and sat down and talked to them, um, you know, they were incredibly open and we had some really good conversations around it. And, you know, they absolutely see it. Um, you know, we still have conversations to this day, you know, pretty regularly about it. Uh, not regularly, but, you know, whenever we're talking, sometimes, you know, the question <laughs> be, hey, what's what's the latest changes that are going on? And, you know, I'll share what I know. But um the the really interesting one was the first time that I saw. Uh, so this was my sister in law and her husband. And now keep in mind, we've known them for 20 plus years. Uh, you know, her husband, they've been married for that long. So for us to be, you know, sitting in a conversation, we had like five or six of us there. Um, the. The interesting thing about the conversation with them is that. Um, the sister saw that what I was saying, like, wow, I see exactly what you're saying. And her husband was 
was agreeing to, you know, and I was checking in with him and he's like, yeah, you know, that's what I remember. There were certain, like even a base, I'll, I'll use the baseball game, uh, the baseball movie as an uh, example. Um, the field of dreams where at the end uh, yeah. was, the, if you build it, um, he will come or they right. will come. Yeah. So I use that one with him because he's a baseball player, loves baseball. No, he'd watch the movie. And I asked him about that. And initially he's like, yeah, um, you know, it's, if you build it, they will come. And then uh, we got further into the conversation and I could see him starting to come into some real um, cognitive dissonance. It's probably the best way to put it. Yep. Um, he's an engineer. He's very intelligent. And he started in his mind, I'm sure what he was doing is starting to connect some dots. Like, okay, if this is the case, then now I'm going to be somebody that's going against the grain. I'm not part of the, the mainstream anymore. I am like, he's starting to feel the responsibility of what it means that this conversation is going the way it's going. And I watched him change in a moment in that conversation, even the things that he had agreed to earlier in the conversation, he started going back and saying, no, that's uh, more. I think about it. That's not what I remember. I remember the, the way, you know, and I just watched this movie not too long ago and come to think of it. It was, if you build it, he will come. And, and that's what it's always been. And so I got to see him do the flip flop, you know, in mid conversation. And even after the conversation, I was checking with his wife. And I was like, what are you seeing? And she's like, yeah, this is really happening. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. so fortunately this hasn't been a real issue in their marriage. Um, she's still tracking and ask me questions every once in a while. And, you know, fortunately, her sister sees it as well. So, I mean, even in my wife's family, there's quite a few that see it. And in my family, I've got, I think my sister sees it. Um, and it's interesting. I haven't even talked to my brother about this yet. I have not gotten the green light from Holy Spirit on this one. Mm -hmm. So we haven't had that conversation yet. But um, I've got a sister and like kind of an adopted sister. And both of them see it clearly. And we have conversations around it. Interesting. So, yeah. So that to me, you know, that would have been that was the most interesting where I saw the flip flop in the middle or not flip flop. I saw the, um, the download, the download. Yeah, that's the yeah. term. You know, he he all of a sudden was totally towing the line on on what's going on now. So that's probably a more common experience that most people have when they're sharing. But for me, that was the first time I saw it. And I've, I really don't think I've seen it as clearly since. That seems pretty clear that. That's the second Thessalonians strong delusion curse because yeah. it's tied to self uh, willful ignorance. So you're sitting there and in your volition, your little soul, your mind, will, and your emotions, uh, you, you run that little algorithm like you're talking about mm -hmm. and you don't want it. So you're like the little five-year-old that's going, nah, 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 nah. You're talking, but I'm not going to listen anymore. Mm -hmm. And God just flips the switch of the connection to him. I don't know if they're going to hell. It's not what I'm saying, but there's a very serious consequence to that. Where I don't believe that when, when he said that, oh, yeah, now I do remember like that. He's not just lying. Right. So that opens the gate to whatever their transmission frequency is. Like, Ernie, tell me about that time you were – you were telling me about this one time where you you recognized the frequency was transmitting. There was something you were you were thinking about. Maybe you can't remember this, but then the thought just came to you about the thing you were thinking about, and you acknowledged in your mind that, wow, if you're not careful, you'll you'll make yourself susceptible to whatever's out there transmitting to our brains. Do you remember that conversation? Uh, like actually, I don't. <laughs> you don't. Yeah. I know that. I know that. I'm not um, saying it didn't happen. I'm just saying I don't remember it. Well, there's, there's, now, and it could have been one of the other people that you talk to frequently. No, it was you. You told me you were standing in a pharmacy and, and you were, anyway, you know, I, I have seen the patents for the nanotechnology that allows them to transmit thought into the human brain and then you have the god uh, voice to skull technology that's old and then you have all of these other technologies 
subliminal through the TVs, infrasonics, all these things that are designed to put thoughts in your head. It's no wonder that this is happening. But somehow our will and the spirit of the Lord tied to truth gives us some force field type of an effect. Because apparently there are those who are able to see and retain that freedom from the, you know, the transmission, right? We seem to still be seeing, but um, we've all experienced well, and, and hopefully that's 100%, but, you know, it's hard to know for sure, you know, what we may be missing. You know, that's a topic I'd like to ask you about. One of the things that comes up on occasion, like all of us here and probably everybody on the transmission acknowledge that this is a phenomenon. It's not misremembering, right? So this is really happening. And so we all... Like there's a consensus that we all we all remember the line in the lamb aggregately, right? And and the majority of the things, the Monopoly guy, Chuck E. Cheese, we all agree that these things were the way we remember them. But then there might be one thing that I remember vividly 30 years ago being in my Bible, and you don't. And so to you, it's a Mandela effect, 100%. To me, it's not a Mandela effect, 100%, right? So there's really only a, a couple of options for that. Let's, let's say lion and lamb. I always remember it being wolf. Let's say that, right? I remember distinctly, which I don't, but I'm just using it as an example. So I could be misremembering. I could have. By the way, that specific one, I have run into one person that she was adamant. She saw all the other stuff. But she remembers a, a radio show back like in the late 80s where they were talking about the wolf and the lamb. Wow. And she's always been aware of it being the wolf. All right. And you can't convince her otherwise, right? She and I'm certain... not interested in that because she saw all the other stuff. She's like, I'm, I get it. You know, all this right. is going on. But she totally saw that one. Perfect example. So one, one thing is she's, she is misremembering. We're all right. And she's actually wrong. OK, she's misremembering it really. No, she didn't experience that. She's confabulating or she's got implanted thought. The second one is that she has clarity. She's cogent in all the other areas, but somehow the, the beamers got to her on this one. Right. So they're beaming a, a, a fake thought into her head on that one thing. Or there's a, a truth bubble or a truth a tr uh, um, an experience or timeline tributary where she's on this main line with everybody, but this one event, she's got this tributary of time or something like that, where it's, it's, so in other words, it's true. Both of you are right. She isn't deceived or having a planted thought or misremembering. It's actually correct for her, but your little timeline varies from her just in that one spot. That's the only thing I can come up with. What do you think about that? I know, I know Ernie's got some thoughts on that because we've talked about it. Yeah. So, um, and I'm just going to add another one. I thought this one was really fascinating because um, revelation or revelations. Yeah. Um, most everybody I've talked to remembers um, the book of Revelations. Um, I do. But, yeah, and also Psalm or Psalms, you yep. know. Um, so that's right. She was, for her, it's always been the book of Psalm. Wow. You know? So for me, that was always Psalms. And she actually had been through um, seminary. You know, she had had training and classes on this. And she could remember, like she was telling me the class that they were having this discussion about why it's titled like it's titled. So, you know, I've seen this a few different times where, you know, somebody that I'm talking to that absolutely sees this, the scripture changes. But it's interesting how we're going back to one thing. One guy also, he's like, I know that it was um, Jiff and not Jiffy. Because choosy mothers choose Jeff. Choosy mothers choose Jeff, right? I remember that, but I also yeah. vividly remember Jiffy. So I remember that? both as well. Yep. So I, I totally remember both. And uh, that's the other thing: dual memories, uh, you know, are are a real thing. You know, yep. there's quite a few of them that I'll remember both versions, and I have to really work hard to remember, you know, like which wow. one I thought the most. 
All right, before we go on, I want to make a, a point on this because it's it's caused it's caused dissension among the ranks. Okay, my my takeaway from this, and you can tell me in the chat what you guys think, is that it's very important if you come to this cross in the road with a brother or sister, not to be dogmatic about what you know is right. The past is, I know I'm right. Well, you don't know everything. You you can't tell me you know all mysteries. And we're sitting here disclosing these experiences. And, and Jason, thank God you're confirming this, that we can all agree on the majority of these, but there can be one or two that are just different. And it doesn't mean that person that differs from you is wrong. It's it's not postmodernism. Like your ex, your experience is your truth and my experience is my truth. Right. We just don't understand this phenomenon. So I'm sorry. I wanted to make that point because it's something that yeah. has come up quite a bit. And I know we can kind of go in some different directions here, but one of the other ones that's attached to this, I think, too, is how certain scriptures or certain changes will happen at different times for different people. Oh, yes, that is very true. You know, I, yeah. there's been some that I just know that I know, like um, like Home Depot. Um, you know, like I was, I was looking at, and I've, it's been a while since I thought about this now, but I saw the the flip flop with, with Home Depot um, versus the Home Depot. And like, I know that it, it said the Home Depot, I'm looking at it. Um, and then the next weekend I'm looking at it saying Home Depot. And I think Ernie and I had the conversation about this. And he's like, yeah, that one's changed a while back. And I'm like, I think that for me, that one was the flip flop. I mean, it was, you know, the Home Depot and then hit Home Depot and then even went back to the Home Depot and then back to Home Depot for me. Because Wow. Like, yeah. So, Ernie, Ernie, I know you want to say something. Yeah, you, yeah, uh, you had some uh, ideas on the on the on this topic of, you know, you and I agreeing on most things, but on one thing I'm really certain I remember it, and to you it's a Mandela effect and how that can be. Are you asking me or Jason? Because that was garbled. Yes, I didn't really hear that. I am. Yes, I'm asking you that. Okay. What was the question? The question is, what do you think is taking place when two people who acknowledge the Mandela effect agree on most of them, but on one, I have a okay. vivid memory of something and you don't. Okay. So my belief is that they've been spraying this stuff on us for years and years and years. I believe it has the nano smart dust in it. We breathe it, we eat it, we drink it. And I think that, uh, you know, of course, our bodies probably eliminate some of it. But my, basically, my stance is I don't think any of us are immune <laughs> to having a false memory implanted. Now, I believe those of us who are walking closely with the Lord are aware of this kind of thing, probably have a higher resistance to it. But it's just it's the explanation. It's the easiest for me that explains how. You know, the three of us or, or this community, like you say, we can all agree on like 98 percent of the stuff. But some of us will disagree on this particular change here, that particular change there. And and in some cases, if somebody just being hard headed, you know, that they want to stick with their memory like theirs can't be wrong. But in other cases, it's like, no, no, I have a an anchor memory because I remember this happened and there's something emotional attached to it. And they've got a whole story behind why they remember it different than you do. And then you also have your own entire story built around why you remember it this particular way so that's my um that and the reason that i believe that this is what it is that, that all of us are in some way some form or fashion have had our memories altered to some degree is because it's the only theory i can come up with that satisfies all the moving parts so it just it just works in my own mind so you're you're saying that it's a a, uh, a nanotechnology uh, attack vector is just dropping that thought in somebody's brain. I mean, I'm not well, being we, cynical. I'm just yeah. clarifying. Right. Yeah. We, we've seen all the patents. We know that they, you know, they've got patents on this technology that claim that they can, they yeah. can do it. So, uh, and of course, you know, who is the prince of the power of the air and what yeah. is the power of the air? It's the frequencies that are broadcast through it. So, I mean, that's, that's my go-to theory. That's All right, I I like that, and I wish Mike was on here because he told me about a story with his wife, where she did the 
the download right in front of him where he she said something. He said, no, that doesn't exist. It's actually like this. And he watched her like, uh, like glitch out, right? But then he said, she goes, oh, now I remember. And then she started to tell the story that made her believe that she was really remembering it. And Mike really insightfully said, well, what were you wearing when you were there? And what day was it? And he started asking her these probing questions. And he was able to expose that the story was implanted. Hmm. Awesome. Whoa. That's clever. Oh, my gosh. It was so chilling to think that that could actually be taking place. So, again, my, my point is that we really have to be humble and not be dogmatic yeah. when we're engaging people in this discussion because you right. just don't have all the information. Okay, I love that you said that. John, the downloaded what... memory, the downloaded memory did not have full details, and he was able no. to expose that. Yes, it was a that genius. was very clever of him to do that. Awesome, it really was. Yeah, so yeah. Ahead, so, yeah, I love that we're talking about this too. Um, you know, going back to the the conversations that you have with people, and you're you know laying out an argument for the Mandela effect and for Bible changes. What I was very careful to do is to say, hey, I'm going to give you a list of what some people think are, are Mandela effects and, you know, the ones that I'm I'm thinking. But don't let it throw you if some of these you don't recognize or you don't see as a as a Mandela effect. You know, just just take what I'm saying. And then if, even if there's just one that is a shift, you know, that, that's changed for you, then then that means that we're talking about something very real. So I, I, I've been very careful not to to focus too much on the specifics of this. I know this is kind of a graduate level conversation we're having now about like what's causing this, but in having some of the original, like the initial conversations with people, I think it's very important to keep it a little bit more generic um, and not yeah. trying to over explain this thing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think that can be a mistake that we get into where we're putting too much meaning behind, you know, what this means or how they're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, instead, just letting them see that this is happening. And so they can kind of catch up to this idea that this is going on. And then they start trying to figure out the answers. All right. So let me make sure I'm clear. Your base, your your approach, if I could call it that, is to just like rapid fire, a different change examples. Hey, finish this scripture. And you give them a scripture and then have them remember it. And then you go to the next one, the next one. And you allow that experience of, having a vivid memory and then finding out it's no longer he reality. That's the convincing tool that you're relying on. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the, and then you're, you're couching all that in a very non-threatening way, like saying, you know, kind of like I could be wrong and maybe you can show me how I'm missing it. And that's very disarming. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. And you, okay. use, you use names and, uh, Stuff that's not Bible changes also like stuff yeah, I start off with just general Mandela effects for sure. You know, I try to keep it as non-threatening as possible because if you're automatically starting off with Bible changes, yeah. I feel like that's um that's incredibly destabilizing as a Christian, you know, to feel like this can happen. So I'm trying to warm them up to the idea that something may be going on. Agreed. Yeah, and that's a lot of us too, are are a lot of us that are came to the Bible changes first saw Bernstein bears and all the things in names, places before we realized the Bible is changing. So we were already convinced. I know I was before I got to the Bible changes. I already knew it was happening. So it was, it was easier right. for me to accept it for sure. Yeah. So I wanted to um, also just finish up kind of that thought that we were having earlier about um, yeah. people having different memories. Um, you know, when uh, so when I'm hearing people say that they have a different memory about something, uh, I'm kind of putting it in a in a in a maybe a little bit different perspective. I've had the opportunity to to do like life coaching with with brothers and sisters, um, with family members, husbands and wives that have been together a long time, and they're talking about memories that happened five, ten, twenty years ago or more. And it's not at all uncommon for me to hear people telling their stories. And then I hear it from somebody else's perspective. And I'm like, is this really going on in the same family? Like they yeah. remember this so differently, you know? Um, so 
I know that there is misremembering that happens sometimes, but I think that really there's an element here where each one of us really is having our own experience. And like that there may be things that they remember because it's significant to them that somebody else remembers other key things and and that's what they're holding on to. So there is some element of that, but okay, so I'm just gonna jump into the deep end here too. Sometimes I really believe that people are having their own kind of bubble experience where, you know, we're taught everything is linear and everything, you know, is uh, is very matter of fact. And, you know, if somebody's having if they're reading their Bible in on one side of the United States and somebody's reading their Bible on the other side of the United States, they absolutely have to be reading the same thing because it came from the same warehouse. Um, but I would say that it's possible you know, like I'm just throwing this out there that people are literally reading different things when they read, you know, that somebody's reading one version and somebody else is reading something else. Um, and that's why, you know, I think that sometimes when we have a real hard time convincing people of things, maybe that's just like they're having their own different experience somehow. You know, they're they're seeing some things differently that maybe they just haven't been able to see through the veil yet. You know, they're still seeing an old version or or whatever. So getting back to this idea, you know, I love Ernie's idea that, you know, it could be these, uh, you know, the nanotechnology that's that's putting people in a different position that they're receiving differently, like their antenna is set up differently. Um, you know, I really do believe we're a spirit inside of a body and DNA um, probably has a big uh, you know, effect on like how all this fits together, you know, uh, maybe, yeah, I've heard it explained like we're maybe like an intent, uh, a TV, and there is a transmission of our spirit that's connected to our body, um, kind of like a TV transmission, you know, if you turn it to exact channel, the, you're on that channel now. So yeah. because of my DNA, my, my, um, my spirit is attached to my body, but there's still, you know, an element of us being you know, connected to God. This is in our home. You know, this is our, you know, we're sojourners in this place. And maybe there's some part of us that's still connected um, to heaven, to, you know, connected to God that there's, you know, like literally transmissions that's going on here um, that can be altered or interrupted in some way. Big thinking, I know, I just wanted to throw that out there. And, you know, I, the thing that I'm convinced of is I don't know the answers here, but I'm I'm OK with other people having different perspectives and not seeing things exactly like I do. Right. It reminds and, me of and Jason. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ernie. Go ahead. Yeah, Jason, what you're saying about the DNA, I think there, there's definitely some some truth to that, because uh, I've listened to several people that are are. Uh, what do they call them? Those people that they are harassed by the government with electronics. The can't think of the term right now. Targeted. But uh, yes, the targeted individuals. Uh, yeah. There's been a, at least a couple of them that came from within the government. And they talk about that once they have your DNA, they are able to broadcast stuff directly to you. Yeah. So I think there's something to that about our DNA in some way, some type of receiving that. a channel like what you were talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, the idea that there's a reality bubble and what you just shared is something that I have heard uh, described with some clarity. Like, you know, we understand in the quantum level that you can have um, – superposition a point can exist in two places at once at the quantum level it's defies our understanding at this level but down there it can happen and then uh quantum entanglement so you have these um these concepts where people <clears throat> reading the same bible can be seeing two different things so you think of uh, uh, the two slit experiment, which, if that's real, proved that uh, the matter is responding to human consciousness. Like I always think of Toy Story, where the toys were uh, active, they were animated. It was kind of the opposite until somebody showed up and then they just go limp, you know. And so the reality maybe has become activated in a way to our consciousness. 
And so that would explain why you could have someone that's at a different consciousness. Now, this sounds kind of new age, but we're just trying to have a understanding here. Somebody at a different consciousness could see the Bible scripture differently than somebody at a, other, another consciousness, right? Because we know that this Mandela effect does have something to do with human consciousness. No question about it. It's affecting right. our memory or not. That's human consciousness. And I know some of the physics behind the quantum dot technology, if the D wave is involved in it, they actually have to create a vacuum of human consciousness for that qubit to operate. They put it in a tube. It goes down to zero Kelvin. By doing that, they, they surround this qubit with a vacuum of human consciousness because that would affect its ability to drop the package into the other dimension and retrieve this, uh, the product, they call it. So what does, what, but what's the point, right? What, what does that matter to us in our daily life? Well, we have to try to um, figure out how we're going to respond to this. Everybody's developed a response to this with your family, with your church, and even with yourself and with God. And I think that the more clarity we get, uh, the safer ground we're going to be on. We're going to be able to be okay with God. And I know there's a lot of people this has offended you. You've become offended at God because he's allowed this. Now, you might not really believe that in your conscious mind, but if you search your heart, you may find that you've been abandoned in a way by God or that God has been uh, somehow unjust or careless. Or, you know, if I was running the universe, I certainly wouldn't allow this, that kind of a thought. Uh, that is normal. It isn't blasphemy. And all I'm saying is that these topics help us process what's happening in our emotions. And it makes us settle down and get a, get a read on this, and then we can formulate a response based on what God is speaking to us individually, right? So your, your uh, gracious, humble approach obviously has been very effective. And so what were, what were some of the things where you messed up or you, you went in and it didn't work or Ooh. You know, people kind of blew up at you or just you, you went away going, oh, that was uh, that was a bomb, you know. <laughs> OK, so, yeah, I, I want to answer that. And then I do want to jump over to um, to respond a little bit more about how we respond to, like, you know, the position we're in now and what to do with it. OK, so uh, the quick story I'll give you on this one is um, I was aware of one of the local pastors that was at my gym. So, you know, probably four or five of the pastors, um, you know, I see them in the gym every once in a while. A couple of them, um, I had had some deep conversations about this and I'd asked, <laughs> yep, the gym. What are you showing, Ernie? Uh, they're asking about my shirt because it says oh, okay. Navy. And I'm saying it, it's, it's a Jesus Navy shirt. Gotcha. Oh, okay. All right. So at the gym, um, there's quite a few different pastors. And that's where I'd kind of connected with a couple of them and said, hey, I want to have this conversation with you. And I even like went and got lunch and came over and we sat down for a couple of hours and had our conversations. But there was one pastor that was there and, and he's probably in the second or third largest church in the area. And um, I felt that it was like I should be bringing this up to him in the locker room. We were the only one i had been wanting to talk to him. We were in the locker room, just the two of us. And um, and I, I introduced myself. I said, let's hey, look, you know, like I know you're a pastor. Um, and I just came out. I was like, are you aware of like the Mandela effect? Are you aware um, that, you know, that Bibles like are changing? Um, like I was very direct and just came out and asked him the questions. And, you know, most pastors are pretty gracious and, and he did act like he wanted to know more. So I talked to him a little bit about it. We had probably a three or four minute conversation um, and he had to go. I mean, he, you know, out of the, the locker room. So after that, didn't make eye contact, wasn't connecting with me. Um, and then like some of the people that I am connected to wanted to go spend some time in his church, um, you know, and have some conversations. And there, you know, I'm gonna get into that in a second. There's like some ministry that we were doing. 
And I felt like because I'd had the conversation with him, he's like, oh, you're with the kook. You know, you're with the person that. So there was a closed door for some people that knew me because of that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that was probably one that I could have handled a whole lot better. You know, like how to have that conversation, uh, because we didn't go far enough for him to, to really be able to relate with me or know where I'm coming from. Instead, it was, you know, like he didn't know me from anybody. So it was probably yeah. not the right way to handle that. So what would you have done differently? You, you've got a one-off opportunity. You don't have a lot of time. How, do you maybe not broach it and maybe ask for a meeting when you have more time? That's that's really the way that I handle it now. You know, I um, it's been pretty rare for me to have a conversation on the fly with somebody. And it's usually because I can tell they're incredibly open to it or maybe already aware of it themselves. So, yeah, I, I think for me, you know, sitting down and having a long conversation and, um, you know, just letting them know that I've been a Christian for a long time, you know, deep walk with the Lord. I know scripture. It's not like, you know, I'm, I'm making stuff up or try, trying to attack them or anything. I'm just wanting to have a real dialogue about something. <clears throat> so if it's all right, I want to go back to, you know, earlier on what you were just saying a minute ago about how we um, how we respond to like now being aware of scriptures. Um, you know, I know that, you know, this is part of an earlier conversation we were talking about, too, like watchmen on the wall, being aware and having information now and then being responsible for bringing this information to the body of Christ. So, you know, and, and I love how you were talking, John, about each one of us having maybe different gifts or different callings and kind of operating in different areas. So. I am so grateful for, you know, people like you and Ernie that are, are being very open and, you know, like broadcasting what's happening. Um, you know, I know, uh, you know, last week you had um, Bill Bean on and, you know, did an amazing um, job. And, you know, I, I really admire what he's doing. You know, like Kat over at e EYA and quite a few others are really like broadcasting this and making sure like people like me that, you know, like I came I started to be aware of this and I'm looking on YouTube for anybody that can have information. So mm -hmm. having a connection point was critical for me. And I know that we, we have a responsibility in the body of Christ to, to do what God's calling us to do. And I feel like you guys are doing an amazing job at that um, for me. And I just want to, you know, kind of illustrate some of the things that this has meant for me and my family. Um, <laughs> one of the first people that I talked to was my daughter. So my daughter was 14 years old at the time. And a few days, literally the Saturday after the next day, um, after I'd learned about all this, I'm getting into a car with her and we're driving to the next state over. We had like three or four hours in the car together. And I'd been praying about that night. And I even asked my wife, is it OK? I mean, you know, is this something I should be doing with our 14 year old daughter? And I felt like I had the green light from from Holy Spirit and what my wife said. So. Boy, did we have a great conversation, you know, driving a few hours that morning. And I started telling her all of this and her response was priceless. She looked at me and she said, Dad, I knew that my life was much more important than what I've seen so far. Like she said, I knew there's so much more to life. I knew that, you know, I'm called to be on an adventure in my life. And this makes so much sense to me that this is going on. And her response was really to dig into the Bible herself. Um, and because the question is like, how can I do this not knowing what the changes are? And I said, well, you know, you pray, <clears throat> ask Holy Spirit to show you, you know, what's what's here. And you have conversations with people you trust about scriptures. You talk to me, you talk to your mom, um, there's a couple other people in her life that she could talk to. <clears throat> so she went on this great adventure to figure this out for herself. Um, nice. So I loved her response to that. And my wife had a very profound response, too. And I think she and I had a very similar response. And that was, OK, it's very clear to me now that spiritual things are happening. And yes, this is probably, you know, not from well, this isn't from God, you know, but it's still the spirit realm is in, intruding and invading our world. And this is just so much more evidence that like miracles happen, that, that spiritual things can happen. So <clears throat> we went into a much deeper um, journey with the Lord and praying for 
like very close relationship with the Lord to be led and to to see the miracles and the things that the the, the apostles were called to do that you know the um, the life that Jesus promised us that we would do greater things uh, you know this started taking on much more meaning to us we already uh, believed it no. we were already wanting to see this happen but boy did we jump into the deep end I mean we're laying hands on the sick and watching them recover we are you know, like being with believers and getting um, into next level prayer and, you know, going into the community and not just focusing on the problem. For us, you know, it's not about putting up banners and telling them the Bible's changing, but it's really to um, to emphasize what's going on in the spirit realm, see people healed. Um, there's an inner healing, you know, like ministry that we do. We, we do prayer rooms for people all the time. And, you know, we see deliverance happening regularly. Um, even recently, we're starting to work as a ministry with a local ministry that's bringing people out of human trafficking and SRA survivors and, you know, just amazing level of, um, you know, like the, the challenges that they're coming from are next level compared to most people. But seeing deliverance, seeing the Lord move in their life and to see people be healed and set free is is what we're living now so this was a catapult for us to have a um, a next level experience we feel like we went from like middle school to graduate level stuff almost overnight because yep. we knew that this is go time like let's we're not holding back anything we are being very bold and even our business went from being you know only focused on the body and the um uh, and the and the mindset you know the emotions when it came to helping people get well we have a wellness center it started to be very focused on the spiritual nature as well. If you don't have a strong spiritual life and connection with God, then, you know, your foundation is not going to um, be so that you can maintain health. And so, so for us, this just shot us into a whole different realm of accuracy and walking with the spirit, dependency on God, um, you know, an amazing level of prayer life, um, you know, just a shift instead of it being, you know, 15 or 20 minutes, whenever we think about it, very conscientious about, you know, like hours in prayer, hours of spending um, time in the spirit and knowing that we are walking out of the last days and that we have an incredible mission to uh, to be going forward with. So, you know, we see, you know, we have people that are um, well, we actually had a ministry that was birthed about a year ago where we have people coming in and, and doing worship nights together once a week. And we do, um, you know, like small groups, um, just going into next level um, power and authority and going into the community, um, praying for people at the uh, in grocery stores or, you know, at the mall. And, you know, like people see us coming. We've got big signs up that say, um, you know, it, need healing, um, need prayer. Um, you know, and people at the mall stopping and we've got a group of three or four people that will pray for them. And we keep seeing people come up with with um, crutches and walk away with them under their arm. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That is awesome. That is such a great testimony. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Great ministry there, Jason. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it's what it's you know, it's all about. Um, you know, again, we said it was go time. It's a realization that, OK, we've been learning and growing and, and being at the food trough long enough, um, you know, like spending time in scriptures, knowing what what, uh, you know, how many decades do you need to be in church before you're the you're a real doer? You're actually doing the work and and taking mm. the responsibility of, of preaching the gospel, if necessary, use words. Um, you know, and laying hands on the sick, seeing them delivered, you know, like doing the, the real work and feeling the responsibility that, hey, we're called to do this. This is, you know, we were created for a time such as this, you know, and it's time to shine. It's time to get out there and to live life with, you know, take the break off, um, you know, get it in that top gear and run. That's awesome. I, I think it's significant to acknowledge that, um, you know, those who think we should keep this under the rug and not stir up any problems by talking about this, where you shared it with your 14-year-old daughter and her response was, Dad, I knew that my life was supposed to be an adventure. <laughs> and she got fired up and, and then revival broke out in your family and your business. Um, yes. Wouldn't it be I've awesome if everyone experienced 
uh, reacted that way? Yeah. Yeah, it would be. I thought of that myself because I'm going out to one church every Sunday. I go to a different church. I sit in their service, and then I meet the pastor on the way out, shake his hand. I tell him, hey, I'm new to the area. Can I come and meet you? Because if I, I've tried calling them up and trying to book a meeting with them, and I can't get in. So this way I get a meeting every time. But one of the things I've noticed is that a lot of these churches, it's like there are these giant buildings with the giant congregation or, you know, a, a church, and then they have schools, and it's all empty. And and half of the church on Sunday morning is empty, and it's just sitting in the maybe f- last three or four rows have about 40 people in it. Like the church is dying, basically, right? And I think, man, you want to turbocharge your ministry? Come on and join us. Join the <laughs> kooks. And you'll maybe lose most of these folks, but then the right. all these other people will come in. And <coughs> you'll have the fire of God, man. <laughs> yeah, and, and talking oh. about the young children, Jason, like with your daughter, of course, my granddaughter, you know, I say it took me a year to get anyone in my family to see it. But my granddaughter, when she saw it, you know, she saw other things and she talked to her friends. And most of these young kids, these teenagers, they see it, or at least my experience from talking to her. When they talk to their friends, they're like, yeah, I know that's changed. I saw that that's changed. It's, it's like, um, I don't know, the younger people are just more receptive. I, I guess they're just less set in their ways. They're more open to new ideas and things. And also haven't uh, had as many years of mind control conditioning that everything has to have a logical explanation. I just don't think that you can that you can practically minister to the saints in 2022 unless you're a full-blown conspiracy theorist church from the pulpit Sunday morning. Talking flat earth, talking chemtrails, talking vax, talking Mandela, everything. Bring it without the fear and favor of man in the context of, uh, you know, Jesus at the center of it all. Because Paul said, if you know all mysteries and have not love, then you're nothing. So understanding all this is critical though from just a self-preservation point of view like like ernie was saying you know we have been warning for years the things that are coming the people who run this world are want you dead right well now they've operationalized their agenda and it's going full blast right now so i don't think you can be like I just want to focus on souls. That That's out the window, man, because they're coming for you under the cloak of, you know, uh, medical emergencies and blah, blah, you know, whatever they're going to come at you. And if you're thinking that we're all kooks, they're going to take you out. And churches like this are going to become huge because people can tell the truth. <laughs> it's pretty obvious, right? You know, and John, on that point, you know, you talk about – the people don't have that strong personal relationship with Jesus. When the time comes where you get to choose between eating or taking the mark, they're going to pick yeah. eating. Wow. And that's another thing that I've noticed in this community. Everyone that I have personally talked to or, or emailed with or something like that, everyone has a closer relationship with Jesus now than they did before yeah. they saw these changes. Yeah. So, being aware of this drives people to that closer relationship with Jesus. And, and I believe without that, it's going to be very difficult, you know, when it comes time to whether, okay, am I going to eat or am I going to take this mark? You know? Right. So you're, it's very well taken. J- Jason, your experience though has been that a, a good number of the people that you shared with this initially, and they saw it uh, have stayed interested in it because one of the things we hear a lot is you might get somebody to agree with you and acknowledge but then they just change back to normal like they either tell you i don't even remember having that conversation or they come back and they say oh like the pastor you talked about he said god will take care of it right but you're seeing a pretty decent number of people that are actually continuing to walk it out like they're living it Correct. Yeah, um, I would, you know, if I had to throw a number at it, probably three dozen. 
Wow. That I know personally. And it's great because, yeah, I can pick up the phone and talk to any of them. Um, or, you know, we get together, you know, at different times as a group and talk about things. We haven't done that quite as much lately, but there for a while, we felt like it was very important for all of us to be, you know, talking regularly about it, keeping up with what's going on. Because, you know, like most of us, I think you hear about it and think, OK, you know, Jesus is coming next month. So we got you know, we don't have much time. Right. Well, that's why I created the cell groups. Uh, if you go to wakeuporelse.com, you can see the calendar. It's Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern, Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern, Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern, and then Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern. We have live cell group meetings by video conference using freeconferencecall.com. And we have a format and a moderator. And we get on there. It's a safe place where you can come and share your journey with other Christian truthers. And it's really ministry. People are getting a lot of comfort from that and, you know, being able to talk what's on their mind and be received. And it's a fellowship. It's a it's a next level from the chat. So, you know, maybe you could share that with your community if they need to find a place for fellowship. Send them our way. Yeah, absolutely. And all, and all of you guys listening, come on out. It's been awesome. You're missing out. So amazing. Oh, this is really comforting and encouraging to see someone who has not just persevered, but really been able to find the combination, you know, and get get a result like you've gotten. It's really astonishing. I think a lot of people are really blown away. Maybe we could take some questions from the chat. Uh, folks on the chat, if you have any questions for Jason or Ernie. You want to uh, type them in the chat? We can uh, respond to those. And then um, what do you think is the silver lining in this, Jason or Ernie? Like God always has us landing on our two feet, even when we're being persecuted. There's always a blessing. God always has a remedy. What do you think God's doing uh, on the on the positive side with this for his church like how is this being used to bring people closer to him any thoughts on that well, well I think, yeah go ahead, go ahead jason <laughs> We're in, yeah, go ahead are you really okay. well i mean you know it's pretty much like what i said before i mean uh, everyone that i you know personally talked to or communicated with uh, that the subject has come up has grown in a closer relationship with Jesus. So, I mean, you can't get better upside than that. Yeah. So I think that's the, the big positive takeaway of being able to see this and recognize it is you just come in closer relationship with Jesus. I mean, look what Jason has done because it started this way in the ministry he's got going now and they're, they're yeah. laying hands on people and healing them. And I'm just, you know, all kinds of things have come out of being in closer relationship with Jesus. I mean, that's what the whole Bible is about coming into relationship with our God mm -hmm. through our, our Lord and savior. So, I mean, I think that's about as positive as it can get. Totally agree. And, you know, just like what I was saying, the impact it had on my family, I mean, it couldn't have been more profound if a you know hand grenade had gone off. In the <laughs> room. Um, it, it really did like wake us up to like, we can't just keep sleepwalking through things and just business as usual. So um, I think for a lot of people, this is the catalyst for, you know, being a kind of jolted into a new reality. And the fact that I have to be dependent on God, I have to, um, you know, I can't even just rely on the mundane um, things that have been written down, even re reading the Bible. I have to read the Bible actively with the Holy Spirit. You know, being spirit led, um, writing out scriptures under the anointing, um, which is something that, you know, my wife really focuses on um, because we have a real love of the word, you know, real love of, of Jesus, mm -hmm. real love of scripture. You know, it's in our heart. It's something that is incredibly precious to us as it should be with all believers. So, you know, we haven't turned our back on the Bible. You know, I know you guys have had this conversation and, you um, you know, instead, this has enhanced our attention to exactly what Holy Spirit is telling us and to be very um, aware, be very uh, present in the reading and not lazy about it. 
because now we have to catch the errors. We have to um, know what Holy Spirit is telling us so that we can be effectively equipped for the calling that he's uh, that he has on our lives. All right. This is a really important topic. I'd like to sh- ask you guys what your thoughts are. So, and again, I'm not trying to dictate what is or isn't or should or shouldn't. Um, it's not dogmatic. I'm just uh, throwing this out there for consideration. There was one guy that called from New Zealand who said he doesn't read the Bible anymore because he doesn't want it to contaminate his memory of the scripture. And I couldn't argue with that, right? But the way that I've decided to view the Bible at this point is like a bowl of oatmeal, and there's one or two poison pills in there, and they're not leaking. And as long as I'm careful and I I can see them, I I eat around them, I can get a full belly, okay? So the person that's totally unaware of the Mandela effect is in great peril, especially if you're a church leader and you're disseminating. It's almost like mini satanic spells you're casting on your congregation. Uh, So what is your thought about what are we supposed to do with the Bible now? How are we supposed to handle the word of God ourselves? How are we supposed to approach the word? And what about like new disciples and that and that kind of thing? Like we should get in the word, brother. You know, <laughs> I don't even want to say that. <laughs> well, you know, my emphasis again is all on relationship with Holy Spirit. You know, being led by the Spirit every day. Um, you know, and for me, this is is taken on a whole new meaning of not just doing things by rote. Hmm. You know, like going around through the day um, with my own plan. You know, it means being dependent every moment of the day on where my attention goes, you know, what I'm um, listening to, what I'm watching, um, you know, the words that I'm speaking. I'm I'm praying for an alignment with God's spirit so that, you know, I'm I'm speaking words of life and I'm I'm moving in in a way that's um, in alignment with what God's doing on the earth today. So when it comes to, to reading scripture, I think that it has to be done with great intention and under the anointing of God. Like I, I don't take it lightly anymore at all. I don't just grab the Bible and just start reading. No, I am making sure that I'm tuned in, that I am, uh, I'm praying in the spirit. I am asking the Lord to reveal truth to me and let me see any error that's here so that I'm, I'm able to navigate this. It's like a minefield is there, but as long as you know where the mines are, you're fine. You know, you just walk around the mine and you can still continue to move forward. So to me, the answer absolutely is having a close relationship with God and being led by the spirit. Now, telling other people, you know, like how a new believer just to jump in, um, you know, on some level, we just have to believe that the Lord can protect and um, and guide people even when they're young, um, you know, that they're you know, they're his responsibility, not mine. And, you know, I, I definitely think like I did with my daughter, you know, pray, um, read and ask questions. And, you know, if there's something that you're not sure about, definitely, you know, check with us. And, you know, we have conversations about scripture, about what she's learning, about what she's getting out of it so that we can help catch any error that might be there. Ernie? What is your thoughts about how we're supposed to handle the scriptures now as individuals and also as ministers? Uh, Well, I mean, I say it depends on your, you know, how long have you been in the scriptures? How much, how well do you know them? Um, And yes, for, for people that are newer Christians, you know, it's, it's a tough situation. Uh, My recommendation, obviously, obviously the most important thing is, is like Jason said, before you read, before you study, uh, you need to pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit scriptures tells us he'll bring all things to our remembrance. So that's, that's the most important thing. And, um, you know, my suggestion is I've had quite a few people, you know, newer Christians ask me, well, you know, what am I supposed to do? And since they're new and they don't really know the scriptures very well, uh, obviously I tell them to, you know, pray first, but I tell them, my suggestion is use a newer version like the ESV or the NIV because there's fewer changes in those versions. Mm -hmm. And I tell them pretty much stick to Matthew, John and Romans and everything you need to know about being a Christian 
you can get huh. from those three books. Yeah, because you start, you know, venturing off into the Old Testament and stuff that you're not familiar with, and you're in the King James, now yeah. you're running into a minefield. But John, you asked for questions from the chat, and Rocco asked a question. He was asking, how do we explain that uh, believers and unbelievers can both see the changes? Well, that's a good question. So, well, here, here are my thoughts on it. Um, first of all, I think one of the common things among people who see it, whether you're a believer or not, is that you've had some type of supernatural experience in your life. So mm -hmm. to start with, your mind is open to the possibility of things that you can't explain. So I think that's the first thing is for the unbelievers is that, you know, they have had some type of, whether it's a positive supernatural experience or a very demonic supernatural experience, they know that the supernatural is real. So <laughs> when they see something that is different from what they remember, you know, their mind is open to the idea of, you know, possibilities other than things that are easily explained. So I think that's part of it. The other thing I would say is since Satan wants to discredit us and our testimony, obviously there are going to be people. So let's just let's just take the mind control, you know, the uh, the mind control theory for a moment that, you know, they implant memories. OK, so if I'm Satan, I'm not going to implant memories, you know, because if it's only the Christians that are seeing this and only the Christians that are talking about it. And that's going to draw more attention than maybe this has got something to do with God. So if I were Satan, my strategy would be to have people that are in the new age and other religions and atheists see it as well. So that it's just a phenomena of crazy people. OK, but not just a phenomenon within the Christian community. So I think that in some cases, uh, you know, it's a deliberate attempt by the whoever's, you know, the supernatural forces or the people with the technology trying to do this to make sure there are people who are not believers that also see it. So that doesn't draw too much attention to just Christianity. And of course, you know, that that's yeah. my opinion and my thoughts on it. I have it point you guys. No, that's very well said. It's clear that it's not random. Like, you know, specific names or movie lines are changing and then scriptures aren't just changing randomly. Somebody's like planning this and flipping these certain buttons to make these changes happen. Mm -hmm. that's, and then Kat is so brilliant. She, she pointed out like how the changes correspond prophetically to what's actually happening in society real time, which mm -hmm. I never even thought of that. that. That's just so amazing. So yeah, it's a, uh, it's a great piece of advice to try to focus on books in the Bible that are, are familiar and give you what you need to find God. And then like, I know what it's like you reading Bible and you hit this jagged passage. It's all angular. The syntax is you're like, uh, uh, you can't even read it. And then the words are wrong and you just get mad. You know, you feel, you feel violated. Like this, this is so frustrating, but I just want to read. I just want to take a minute and read Psalms 23. I've just read it earlier and it really ministered to me. It washed over my soul. I don't, I'm sure there's some changes in here, but they're very minor. So just let, let me just put this out here and just hear the words of Psalm 23. You ready? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. That is wow. money in the bank. Yes. That is just food from bread from heaven. And it's like we are not going to let the devil knock us off of our stool. Okay. We're going right. to take this and we're going to be wise and we're going to, we're going to, 
I know I shouldn't say we. This is my philosophy at this point. Now check back with me in a month from now. I may, you know, I just I just released a video that was a juggernaut of filth. It was a cesspool of mind-boggling blasphemy, one after another. It's like 20 passages of concentrated perversion and fall and doctrine that just like female angels. Jesus hacking people's heads off, two men in a bed, men breastfeeding. David gets an erection when he's with Jonathan. They're kissing and they're bowing down, which is euphemism for having sex. In, in Job, it says that if I do this, then let others bow down upon my wife and grind unto her. Well, that's two euphemisms. These are horrendous blasphemies. Boom! In your face. And then... You go, well, what's the use? You know, the Bible is pornographic not nightmare. I'm, I'm throwing it out the window. No, I wouldn't suggest that yet because this is still in there. And as I'm preparing these talks, I'll, I'll remember, oh, the passage somewhere that says that. I'll go to it. I'll pull it out. I can still glean the, 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 the meaning of the passages and learn God's ways. But I think the time is going to come very soon when it's going to be more and more difficult. You know, there's going to be a law of diminishing return, <laughs> being able to go to the word. I don't know. It's Amos 8, man. Amos 8 is in progress. Yeah, and it's going to come to an end eventually. What do you guys think of that? You know, um, my daughter is now 18. And she is earnestly seeking the Lord. And um, it, it was time for her to get her own Bible again. She had had you know, one as a, a child and she had been using that. And um, she prayed earnestly for like what direction to go, um, which version to get and you know, how to walk forward with this. And much to my initial surprise, she felt like the answer she got from the Lord was the King James Version. And I'm like, okay, I know that version has got so many errors. You know, you can, like, in my opinion, you can open up to just about any page and there's going to be problems. So um, maybe in this, in this case for her, you know, this is really beneficial for her because she can see more clearly where there's problems <laughs> than mm -hmm. maybe some of the other versions where it's not so obvious. But you know, I do trust that she's hearing from the Lord and, you know, she studies that Bible and she is, she is a powerhouse. She sees in the spirit. She is very bold. She um, loves the Lord. I mean, the worship that that girl gets into is amazing. And every time she's at a, like a ministry event with other adults and, you know, I've got people that come to me all the time and to my wife and say, oh my gosh, you know, your daughter is just amazing. You know, what a powerhouse. So, you know, here she is in an early age, um, you know, and this is how she's navigating. That's awesome. Go right to the. Well, she engine. also knows that if she sees something that's kind of weird or, or doesn't sound right, she can come to you and, and you can uh, help her with that. It's a really phenomenal sense of destiny that I've been feeling. When you think about the apostles who were born at a certain time, right at the right area, they were right the right age, and out of all the people that Jesus talked to, they were the, uh, the few, and then they were the ones when he said, follow me, uh, and they were destiny. I mean, they were like hit the lottery destiny, right? And so here we are. Well, the excuse me. Let me jump in, John, if I yeah. can. Um, you know, and if you really break down their lives, they were a mess. Yeah. But <laughs> there they was were. so much that was going on when Jesus was with them that, you know, it's like, yeah. oh my gosh, how can you get it so wrong? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it, it's that to me just lets us, lets me know that, you know, he can use us in our mess and, you know, he, <laughs> he gives us the direction he gives us, you know, he gave them the spirit, you know, the Holy spirit. So, the ministry after Jesus left is when they really shone, you know, when they were shining, when they were, um, you know, really at their best. And, you know, we, my wife and I have had this conversation several times recently about, 
you know, doing ministry with people, you know, we can be messy. There's all kinds of stuff that's, that, you know, that we're dealing with, but relying on Holy Spirit and, you know, moving in his footsteps, he he's able to do even though we we're 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 like that. So, you know, the to me, it's a, it's a real blessing to read about the apostles and see that they it's not like they just got it right away. And yeah. you know, we're 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 getting it and, and doing all the things. But, you know, by his grace, they were able to move into that. Right. And. I, that's well said. The, the thing that I was uh, conscious of was there's a passage that talks about if you continue willfully in sin, it speaks about lightly esteeming the grace of God. Mm. And so there's this aspect of the sovereignty of God. When you are visited by the sovereignty of God, it is an awesome honor and an awesome moment that you really need to respond properly to and not lightly esteem it. And those on this transmission and those that will listen in the, in the recorded version have received a very special visitation by seeing these changes. Because I want you to think about, let's say there's 8 billion people on the flat earth, right? And how many of them are born again believers? 1% to 3%, 5%? It's probably not much more than that. And then out of all of this believers, this what is a remnant, how many of them see the changes? I don't know, but it ain't a lot, right? It's not a lot. And you, you, dear soul, are in that percentage. <laughs> <laughs> and my question to you is, what are you going to do with that sovereign visitation of grace? that you have been gifted with. I don't know. I, you have to get with the Lord on that. But I, I tell you what I believe is not, you're not supposed to do is be a spectator. Okay. I do not believe that we are called, but given this kind of sovereign destiny and that we're supposed to just consume all of this information, almost like entertainment. There is a burden that is laid upon the apostles. 11 of them uh, according to history died and they were they were uh, persecuted and they were martyred and then the, they couldn't boil John twice I believe they tried to boil him in oil and they couldn't do it he wouldn't die so they they uh what do you call it when you send somebody off you exile him so that was their fate so join us <laughs> You get to be persecuted and have your spouse divorce you and your children won't even want to. <laughs> and then you won't want to go to church and then all kinds of cool stuff happens. But would you really have it any other way? Let's be honest. Let's be honest. Wow. What an amazing journey, Jason. We are just so grateful that you have just really blown my hair back uh, to a certain degree on what kind of effect and impact you've had. It's really well, amazing. You. Well, and, well, you, you know, know any believer. Jason, go ahead. You know, and Jason talks about, you know, sharing this with people that he knows and is close to and stuff like that. But I know for a fact he told me a story that a guy that he met at a convention, I mean, it was a, a Christian type convention that he just kind of planted the seed with that guy which uh, grew into this fellow seeing the changes, you know, you know, elaborate on that just a little bit, Jason. Mm. Yeah, it was a conference that we were at. And um, unfortunately, the, the teaching that was going on, uh, the, the pastor or the minister there was emphasizing some of the changes as evidence that people really don't read their Bible enough. So you have to, you know, read your Bible more because these are the things that people think is in the Bible, but it's really not there. So there were four or five different things that showed up in that conversation. And uh, immediately I knew what was going on. You know, I'm like, OK, you know, he's he's using this as evidence that people need to be paying more attention to their Bible because, um, you know, it's it gave his speech a lot more punch because he's saying, OK, you know, who knows? this, the answer for this. And all these people are raising their hands and he's like, nope, you're wrong. 
And I watched the response of the people, you know, being called out as being wrong on scripture, but it was because the scriptures had changed. No, you're kidding me. <laughs> Did the guy know it? The Did guy he... didn't know it. You know, he now the one that was the pastor was um he was just using this as evidence that people don't read their Bible enough. Wow. Um and the people in that room, some of them were crestfallen. I mean, I was just watching them struggle. One guy in particular, I was watching him struggle with this. Um, and then, you know, we kind of moved on and I was asking the Lord, okay, is there anybody in this room or, you know, what's my role here? What do I need to do? Do I go to the minister or do I go to anyone? And he really highlighted one person that I watched him kind of shaking his head and going back into different scriptures. And I could just, I knew what he was dealing with. Everybody else seemed to just go right along with it. I'm like, okay, you know, misremembering, you know, I thought that's what the scripture says and they're all just going on to the next thing. But I watched him just kind of sitting in his chair for a little bit. And as things cleared out and there wasn't that many other people in the room, I just came up to him and said, brother, you struggled with what was shared in here, don't, didn't you? And he said, yeah, I did. And I said, um, how about these couple of scriptures that, um, you know, that he talked about? And he's like, I really thought this is what it said. And I said, you and I need to have conversation. <laughs> And um, we scheduled it, you know, because I told him, look, I can't, it's not anything I'm going to get into right now. But if you're interested in having a conversation about what just happened in this room, um, you know, I told him a little bit about me and how long I'd been a believer and, you know, that I really wanted to, to impart some truth to him to make him. I said, this is going to really resolve why you're feeling off right now. And he wanted to hear it. So we scheduled a time and I drove out to his house. He was like a, an hour or more away from me. But um, but we we went and had a great conversation. We took a walk and, and sat in a park and had a long conversation and um, he received it. You know, I haven't talked to him much since then. Like one time about a month later, I think we talked. But, um, you know, that was one of those times that the Lord told me to go someone that I didn't know at all until that conference. That is amazing. Yeah, that's the thing. We're we're right in other words we're not deceived and there's a lot of people that are seeing these and they're scratching their head and they're really in need of someone to come along like there's a proverb that says see those who are going to destruction oh hold them back we are not to be spectators we've listened long enough and we need to start becoming bold in this witness and sharing with people hey are you interested in bible prophecy uh you thinking about end time stuff yeah well there's a prophecy that actually that's being fulfilled right now that a lot of people aren't familiar with now what are they going to say oh well what is it so now you have a you know a willing participant to talk to um i'm just looking up a passage here jason and i'm going to get it in a second bible study okay uh Second Kings two ten. This is um, when they had crossed Elijah and Elisha. Tell me, this is tell me what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? Can you go ahead and ask me that question? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little confusing, isn't it? <laughs> go ahead, ask me, John. Tell me what I could do for you before I'm taken from you here. All right. Yeah. What What can you do for me before you're taken from me? Jason, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. <laughs> mm. Well, Elijah said, you ask a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet, if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, mm. it will not. So all the point I wanted to make here is that there is, and there's other examples of this, uh, a transference of anointing. Yeah. Uh, there was even one where... Um, was it it was Elijah's bones was in this grave or something and they threw this dead Philistine on the, his bones and the guy's bones were so full of the Holy Ghost that the, the Philistine was risen from, <laughs> he rose from the dead just touching his bones and then of course you have Paul's handkerchiefs were anointed from being in his proximity and they would take the handkerchiefs and it might just be a point of contact in the faith of the people it didn't have anything to do with it but but there is a transference of anointings and graces and so in these last days i believe god is going to 
uh, you know, have people that are going to be specially anointed for these special jobs. And you're one of them, brother. I believe that. And I think that God would have you to maybe somehow, you know, pray for us maybe. And, and uh, for those who'd like to receive that special grace to just cut right through to the people like you do and, and uh, telling the story, would you be open to that? Absolutely. Praise the Lord. All right. So I'm just going to ask everybody on the chat just to press the pause button on the chat. And let's just bow our heads and just open our hearts. You know, maybe hold your hands up like this so you're in a, in a, a position of, of receiving from God. And we're just going to ask God to come and ask, to ask Jason to lead, um, however God leads him, to pray for us to receive his grace to share this story. Because it is a supernatural venture we're on, and we need God's help. All right? Go ahead, Absolutely. Brother. <clears throat> So, Father, right now, thank you for um, thank you for what you are doing in this world today. Um, thank you for the revelation of who you are. Lord, right now, I ask for um, your anointing and speaking over these brothers and sisters to receive from you what you have, have imparted into me, which is, first of all, a greater love. Mm. So, Lord, I pray for the love of the father to be imparted into each person that is hearing my words right now a love that comes from heaven that is genuine and pure perfect love perfect love which casts out all fear of the world that we are living in right now the the challenges the things that are going on here in the sin-filled realm so lord i pray for perfect love over each one of your of your children right now in the within the sound of my voice i pray for an anointing to speak your truth and to be accurate and to impart into those that are around them a revelation of of love a revelation of truth and to be heard as if they're speaking straight from the throne room so lord thank you for softening hearts, healing souls, bringing each one into a greater alignment with you and a love of truth and a love of you. So I pray this blessing over each person, anointing to speak the truth and to operate and under the anointing of your spirit in Jesus name. Awesome. Amen. Go ahead, Ernie. Oh, you said amen. Okay. I believe and I receive. I got yeah. that from a guy who had a ministry. This guy went to heaven supposedly all the time and he'd come back and he would had a ministry of getting people healed. But also when he would pray for them, they would start having visions and getting caught up to heaven. And what he said, Jesus told him, when you pray for people, tell them to say this after you pray for them. I believe and I receive. <laughs> I just... I never forgot that. I just picked that up, and I always do that now. Whenever somebody prays, I believe and I receive. Amen. I mean, that can't hurt you, right? So, wow, what a great, oh, my gosh, what a great uh, story, Jason. And uh, I know it's been two hours. I was thinking we'd go an hour. You certainly, <laughs> we could just keep rocking. It's just I don't want you to feel obligated to stay on, but uh, – I know. What are your thoughts on you have life going on with family and stuff like that? Hey, brother, I'm I'm all in right now. Um, wow, wow. In fact, my wife I think is um, is listening to to the to the show as well, and she what? texted me a minute ago, and so she's giving me the green light to spend as much time. So I'm here. Well, this is really uh, I think a important topic. I think that the people who see it and they acknowledge it, but then it just kind of falls away as a thing that's, you know, not really relevant is a mystery to me. Like this is such a front burner issue for the body of Christ. Um, and so how has it, what, what prominence does it play in your life? It sounds like it's still kind of a front burner issue for you. Is that true? <clears throat> 
Yes and no. Um, I, I think that anything that's going on in the world today. Um, <laughs> all right. So let me back up a little bit. You know, I know that there are so many different levels of truth that people, you know, can sometimes get really lost on specific rabbit trails. I know Ernie and I have had these conversations. Um, you know, there's there's so many things that we can spend our time on. And I know that you know, the Lord is going to lead us to pay attention to the things that we need to pay attention to in our life. And for me, this was like at the forefront for two or three years, for sure. Yeah. You know, I'm going in on four and a half years right now, It'll be five years this October. Um, and I haven't lost a passion for truth and for knowing what what's happening. But at the same time, there's been just a lot more focus on um, like seeing people delivered, seeing people healed. Um, moving forward in ministry. And every time I get an opportunity to talk about what's going on, you know, at a deeper level with Bible changes and, um, you know, like the Mandela effect or quantum changes or whatever you want to call that, I get energized. I love it. You know, I want to have those conversations. Um, it's something that's very pertinent for me. But, you know, if you were to ask my wife, it's something that doesn't really hit her radar all that much. You know, she's yeah. just not anywhere near as interested. And I love that. You know, we've got real balance here where she's, you know, like her passion is seeing people healed. You know, mm -hmm. like she really wants to see that. She loves to see the power of God and people be, um, you know, like feeling and, and operating under the anointing. And we pray over, you know, like um, our facility. And when people come in, oftentimes we'll get believers will come in and go, wow. Or even non-believers say there's just something different about this place. Yeah. And so the real focus is, you know, for people to experience the power and the presence of God and to have uh, a real, um, you know, um, a real experience in in the spirit world and to 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 have, uh, you know, a true encounter with God. And for us, that doesn't mean as much talking about the problems because we see all the problems, especially with healthcare. Um, you know, seeing people, you know, in the health industry, um, everything from the Jabadoo, as, as Ernie, I think, says, um, to, you know, the injuries that are happening. Um, you know, there's all kind. I mean, we're aware of just so many layers of health issues that are happening in this world today that that have a supernatural um, nature to it. You know, the, you know, the way that viruses or diseases show up, um, you know, we're, we're tracking all kinds of, you know, if you want to talk about truth and the problems um, we have to know when to talk about these specific problems with people or, and when not to, you know, sometimes we've got believers that we know are dealing with health challenges that are related to um, specific things that are going on in the world today that are very evil and very dark, but knowing when to have each conversation about the problem versus when to have the conversations about the solution and, you know, getting closer to God and pursuing him and looking for, for truth, um, you know, and, and operating in power. So, so for us, um, it's not as much of a, a, like a driving passion that people see Bible changes. But again, I'm I do love the fact that there are people that do that. And like, you know, I love that you have these groups that are going on and being able to, you know, to point people in that direction for the support that they need in the community yeah. um, and to be able to get answers to like what's going on in the world today with this. Um, you know, it's just so critically important that this this message is getting out. But, you know, for us. You know, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Each one of us have different focuses and different ministries and different callings. And, you know, the Bible changes just haven't been a big a big part of what we're sharing with the average person. No doubt. And of course, that's understandable. And I I can't imagine, you know, everybody making this their life's focus. Uh, I have received i believe a, a, a direct calling from the lord early on it percolated for a number of years where i didn't do anything but i knew eventually that i would be in this position where i'd be bringing comfort to people in the area of heart issues mm. like one of the videos i created early on was walking through the mandela effect with jesus and it's basically around the heartache 
the confusion, the frustration, the embarrassment of finding out these things and then having your loved ones, that's your spouse and your children, not seeing it and then giving you these ultimatums like, I don't want you to talk about that. And if you do, we won't have a relationship. Mm. And you're, you're plunged into this quagmire of, of uh, like a time, a truth timeout. You're told these are the conditions to have a relationship with me. You have to pretend you believe like I do. And it's very debilitating and frustrating and, and it's, uh, I don't believe it's it's recon it's, it, I do believe it's an irreconcilable problem, and so this type of ministry will have no shortage of customers. <laughs> I mean, there is going to continue to be people that need triage, like myself. I cry almost every day. I think I cried this morning. Yes, I was in the car. And I have these little revelations of my daughters growing up without me 10 minutes down the road because of what I believe. And I think how, how unnecessary this is. Hmm. And so there's all these people that have had these ultimatums on this transmission. They've been told, you know, there's people who are divorced like I am. There's people who are on the verge of divorce. There's people who have lost their best friends. Or they have these very guarded um, type of superficial relationships that they're trying to maintain. But each party knows there's this giant elephant in the room and it just ain't working. So you basically have to choose between what I call your happy life or you have to choose the kingdom of heaven and the war life where you contend for the truth, which usually leaves a trail of destruction behind you. <laughs> so that is a topic that I'm very passionate about because I'm living it. And I hear from people regularly who are living it. It's almost universal. People like your situation is quite unique. And you're very fortunate because your spouse reacted the way I wish my spouse had reacted. You know, let me look into this and I'll, you know, seriously consider it. And then, of course, she was able to see it. And now you have harmony. So maybe you could share your thoughts and Ernie as well. What, what, what are people to do if they have a spouse and family that tells them this is a no go zone. And then you have this, you know, you have a zeal for them. You want to help, you know, you have compassion for them, but you can't help them. So you have to hold all that in. It's just, it's terrible. It's an awful scenario. John, I'm just going to ask the question. Um, you know, I haven't, followed a whole lot lately with what's been going on, but are you aware of your calling to be a prophet? Huh? You I mean, you're elaborate on? Clearly you're operating in the prophetic, right? Okay. So the prophet has these kind of issues in their life, you know, like <laughs> what? what kind of issues? <laughs> Speaking the truth and it being um, a lot of times it's just not well received. Yeah. Okay. Well, I never considered myself a prophet. Uh, you don't feel like you operate in the prophetic, um, you know, in that yeah. gifting? I guess. I'm just kind of going along with the ride, on the ride, okay. to be honest with you. Well, you know, the prophet um, speaks the truth no matter what the cost is. I'll take that. Yeah. And I just believe that, you know, you have a real ability to operate in truth, um, no matter the consequences. And, you know, it can be really hard for the people in your life to, 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 to accept that and to flow and to understand what's happening. I definitely feel misunderstood. Mm -hmm. How many of you feel misunderstood as well? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that I've is been misunderstood long before this ever started. <laughs> <laughs> See, Ernie's a prophet too, man. 
<laughs> this is a conclave of prophets. <laughs> I was joking around with Ernie today. I said I sent away for this certificate from the uh, Mississippi Certificate Club. So now I'm a bishop. So you all have to call me Bishop John. <laughs> he said, you already got enough problems. Don't say that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, yeah, I can relate to the what you said that, you know, I've I've. I'm kind of Mach 5 with my hair on fire, and it gets me in a lot of trouble. Like, I'm, like, extreme. I'm hot or cold or whatever. But, you know, there is a part of me that has made that decision. Like, I will not compromise yeah. on certain things, no matter what it costs. Like, for instance, I have never wore a mask. And there were a bunch of times that it got me into a lot of hot water with my kids especially. And then I couldn't go to the dentist. I even filmed myself going to the dentist and I showed it on here because they said I could come without a mask. And then, it, you know, so those are all the earmarks of truthers, though. That's what truthers are, is they are uncompromising. That's why they are truthers, because they refuse to go along with to get along. And so I, I think that everybody on here is operating in that capacity. Mm. Yeah, to some degree. I mean, you better be uncompromising. Yeah, well, I think there's it's one thing to be un uncompromising with the truth and knowing, you know, the truth that God's giving you. But I think that, uh, you know, it's, you know, for some people, it, that's not enough. They have to make sure that everybody else knows the truth. <laughs> Okay. Yes, that's that. That's another uh, observation of being evangelistic or having having a, a, an apostolic type of a, of an anointing. So, basically, my understanding of you know the fivefold is is the apostles. They basically are like entrepreneurs in a sense. They go out and start businesses for God. They go, an apostolic guy will go into an area, and when he leaves, there'll be 10 churches there. That's apostolic. And then the prophet is like the, the police of the body of Christ. He comes in, and he's really, he's really not rigid, but he's by the book. And uh, he's always looking for the, the is that legal? So he's like an attorney for God and a policeman for God, and he sniffs out what's wrong because holiness is a doorway to more of God. That's all he wants. He wants more of God, and compromise stinks. It gets in the way, and he doesn't like it. So he talks about it. He confronts it, and, yeah, it gets him into a lot of trouble because most people want to have their happy life. That's the problem. So, yeah, it makes it a lonely road. Hey, guys, I'll be back in just a few minutes. I have to yeah. feed my cat. Of course, the cat is <laughs> He's never going to leave me alone. <laughs> I've noticed I'll be back that. in a few minutes. Cat has been with us the whole time, practically. Yes, yes. He's, he's getting really, really annoyed with me. So I'll be back in a few minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that people on this call have told me in conversations emails and posts that they're discovering these truths not just mandela but flat earth camp trails you name it whatever conspiracy theory instantly brought terrible consequences into their life with their people in their center of influence so it's pretty much the norm and you know my my goal here is sort of out of self-preservation because when I, you know, if you need money, you got to give money. If you need love, you give love. Uh, there's a proverb that says, if anyone desire friends, let him first show himself friendly. Well, if it wasn't for this fellowship, I would be in a heap over there in the corner. A mess. So I've learned to rely on others. And then by giving to others, I'm able to, you know, get what I need from God. So that's part of my motivation. And then 
the other part is just the obedience to the Holy Spirit. The des the, the sense of destiny that I was just talking about is not something you can take lightly. And the idea that I would be given a voice into this. I'm I'm gonna think about that the other day. Think of Kat. Kat has been rocking and rolling for five years uninterrupted. She's probably the only person in the entire world that is doing or has done what she's done. Mm-hmm. Period. Right. So we're like these little teeny like people with nothing. I have no documentation. I'm, you know what am I? And I'm I'm your bishop. Um, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's why I got my bishop certificate. I'll be posting that later. Um, I mean, I just, I'm excited about this. To, you know, there's a part of me that just loves being in the middle of God's destiny. So, because that's how we're created. We're created to, on a search for significance. Like mm-hmm. when you're a little kid, you're like, look what I can do, Dad. Watch me. Well, you never lose that intrinsic need to feel significant that's given to us by god and when we come to adulthood it's it draws us to god's destiny for us like paul said i was not disobedient to the heavenly vision so there is a plan there is a purpose it's a blueprint it's laid out in heaven in books and and it's your job to find it on the anvil of prayer and get it get the mind of christ and then run with it. And that's where we are, right here. Yeah. Running with the runners. Yeah, and and here we are at the most exciting point of human history, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Got to like, believe it. Yeah, I mean, here we are. I mean, the it's it's all the prophecies have been um aiming for this season that we're living in right now. Yeah. Yeah, and the the idea that we experienced the Mandela effect and then went back. I know Ernie shared his testimony where God told him through somebody that this was happening. I think it was your granddaughter. And then many of us sought God's confirmation, like, God, if this is really happening, you're going to have to show me in the word or I'm not going to believe it. And of course, we went back into the scriptures and we found Daniel 7, 25 and Revelation 22. Yep, Thessalonians 2. I had pastor tell me the other day, John, the devil doesn't have that much power. And I said, well, with all due respect, my Bible says that God uh, gave him power to wage war against the saints in the book of Revelation. I mean, it doesn't get any clearer than that. So here we are, the, the war is raging, and almost the entire body of Christ is under a spell. And they recalcitrant. They're, they're, they actually fit the dictionary definition of delusional. Delusional means that you are you believe what's wrong and you're resistant to facts. That's the dictionary definition of delusional. And so when I heard about your testimony, I was like, oh, we got to get Jason in here and, and tune us up. Because we need to be about our father's business and s- go out and and save these men and women of God and our brothers and sisters from this thing. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing like hearing, you know, uh, a success story, a string of success stories to encourage people that, hey, Jason did that. It can be done. That's right. Oh, by and the way, a lot of people, I mean, we get we get so many of us, uh, you know, get the door shut in their face so many times that uh, it's just very encouraging to know that uh, success can be had at this. You just need yeah. to, you know, invite the Holy Spirit and just kind of trust how he leads you to do it, which I think is basically the secret to your success. There is you just kind of you're, you're able to go with how the Holy Spirit leads you to do it. Mm. You know, kind of a funny story. Um, when I was having a conversation with Kat in one of the hangouts back in 2018, she had somebody else on briefly, and he basically called me a liar. He's like, there is no way that this guy, you remember that? Yep. There's no way this guy has this many people in his life that, that see the changes and that he's had this level of success. 
And I said, OK, you know, what am I going to need to do? You know, like, um, you know, what's what's going to be the best answer here? And Kat asked me if I'd be able to um, to bring a couple of people on. I was like, absolutely. So I grabbed my list and um, the first two people I, I reached out to said, yeah, they'd love to come on. So I had <laughs> um, I had Wendy and Michael um, or no, David came on and we had a full um, show like this. They they were on for a couple of hours sharing, you know, all the things. And oh, man. like, there they are. <laughs> yep, so I remember awesome. watching that one, too. Yeah, David is something else. He's he's a um, now he's a minister to some degree right now. He's not a pastor, um, but he does um, he he does help a lot with as a um, you know he does a lot of training and teachings, and he's regularly behind a pulpit. And he um, he sees all the changes, and we have conversations. You know, uh, every so often we'll make sure we do lunch together and get caught up. All right. Well, let me just put this out there. One of the things that I believe God has given me as a blueprint is there will be a con. What's the word? A convocave? No, I'm, I can't remember the word. It's a. It's it's going to be. There's going to be a ministry to church leaders that's going to come out of this, hmm. for a number of reasons. One of them, it's already happening. It's an evangelistic outreach, in a sense, like you did, to go out and share the story and give them documentation if they don't see it right away. Then for those who do see it, there's going to then be a support ministry to help shorten their learning curve and then support them in their journey because we've kind of a couple of steps ahead of them, right? But then the third part of this is going to be for documentation okay in other words if there's one guy in the world waving his arms and saying i remember the Mon monopoly guy had a monocle and he has one guy with one vivid memory the whole world would dismiss him as a kook right but what if i have 20 pastors of established churches who i meet with with a, a group of brothers and sisters, right? We have this little panel that we meet with them on a regular basis and they consult with us and we pray with them and we share with them and help them steward their ministries in the light of the Mandela effect. But then they are willing to publicly proclaim their belief, right? So I can then take that and go to another pastor and say, look, I know that we've never met, but I have these 20 pastors over here who have written, signed these affidavits, you know, it's kind of a thing. And they have come out publicly that this is really happening. Well, my stock goes up like boom, like that, right? So God's going to give us strategies and plans and anointings as we go out and stumble through this we're going to have God's going to bring people like you and he's going to give us a piece of the puzzle. And then we're going to get more and more um, effective at this and begin to reach. And I believe that point is coming very soon. There's going to be a critical, a tipping point. And it's because the Bible is becoming so graphically perverted that it's going to become, I think, easier in a way to share this. This last video I released is so horrendous that I trembled before I pushed the button. But I really felt the Lord was telling me to do it. Um, and one of the most profound things about it is it completely removes the argument that you're misremembering. Because we've been relying on that, hoping that they would bridge the gap between their radical misremembering experience and the conclusion that the Bible is supernaturally changing. And in most cases, for most of us, it's not happening. Well, now I have a new attack vector in a sense. I have a new approach. Okay, the approach is the Bible is filled with pornographic, perverted sexual <clears throat> innuendo and horrendous, blasphemous doctrine. It appears that way in the English, and in many cases, it's supported by the underlying original language in the concordance. 
Now what are they going to do? This is only part one. I'm working on part two. And I think that it's going to be a lot more difficult for them to brush us off. But time will tell. And, uh, and I don't know what the end looks like. I don't know. You know, this is not like a Happy Bells kind of a story. This is a, this is a horrible thing to have to talk about. It's horrible. But I'm compelled. I'm compelled to, to warn my brothers who are standing at the front of the, of the church and they're talking about these things like, you know, breast men breastfeeding and Jesus lopping heads off. And like I tell them, I show them the passage where Jesus says, bring them before me and slay them, right? And I go, doesn't that rub you the wrong way? And they're like, no. Whew. They just say it's a parable of the future judgment or whatever. I'm like, that just rings hollow to me. I just, I just don't. I don't believe you. And you don't believe you either. Like they go to the lion and the lamb and it's wolf. I'm go and they and I go, come on, Pastor, doesn't that rub you the wrong way? No. And I I go like this, you're lying, and you know it. <laughs> you are lying and you know it. It rubs you the wrong way. You're like, Yeah, you're right. But you said it. They don't want to give up their thing. I mean, they don't want this to be true. It's too much at stake. So how do you, you just move on? You just let him go with that and go to the next guy? Okay, so you're asking me, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a growth area for me. I think that's okay. definitely <laughs> Well, you know, from my perspective, the strategies like that we can come up with are, you know, they're only going to go so far if the Lord isn't in the middle of it. So, yeah. you know, trying to trying to figure this thing out, I've already thrown in the towel on that. Um, you know, there's so much that I know that uh, is just beyond my understanding. Um, you know, like we were talking about, um, you know, dual memories and um, maybe seeing changes at different times in different places. There's just so many things about this that I'm OK not knowing. You know, there's some other big ones that you know have nothing to do with the Mandela effect that I'm OK not knowing. You know, right now is the Lord gives me this revelation. Fantastic. But, you know, I know there's plenty of things that I'm just not going to get and like how to be smart enough or how to use strategy well enough in order to to get a specific outcome with a specific person. I think that has to be led by the spirit. You know, when it's the right time, like I know when I'm working with clients, I continue to ask the Lord, is this the right person and is it the right time? Those are the two questions that I always ask. And if it is, then I know it's going to be incredibly powerful for them because it's spirit led and it's the right timing for them. If it's just me trying to convince them something or to put together enough strategy, well, they're in trouble because I'm just not smart enough to to help them with their issues in their life. So for me, I know that it's I have to work with Holy Spirit rather than telling Holy Spirit to work with me. Absolutely. I totally so, receive what I you're saying. You're doing that, um, but, you know, I'm just I'm given a little bit of different perspective of when I'm talking to specific people. You know, I'm asking God first, is it the right time? Is it the right person? And to use my mouth when I'm speaking to this person, because I know when you're telling me that I've got a green light, that it's their time. That's so well said. Like, the Bible does attribute salvation to both God and man. Okay, so it says, he that wins souls is wise. Well, that's attributing it to man. And then it says, how will they know unless they hear? And how will they hear unless someone is sent? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Yes. So in the economy of God, he has said it so in his infinite wisdom that men would bring the message. Now, the men need training, and they need, you know, to understand the doctrines of the Bible, and then they need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And you had a concerted effort. I wrote down the notes. It was purposeful. You made a list. You prepared your talk. But ultimately, what I hear you saying over and over is there's a very strong sense of dependence on God. 
Yes. Throughout the process. Yes. You are not arrogant or prideful in your approach. You are very dependent on the Holy Spirit, moment to moment, breath to breath, to allow wow. the other side of the equation, the great evangelist, to do his work. Yes. Because the Holy Spirit will convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment, not me. Yes. So I re totally receive that. I'll be much more sensitive to that as I go forward and make certain that I am listening, hearkening as I go. So that yeah, yeah. My wife and I, go ahead, Ernie. Our, our job is just to plant seeds. I mean, you know, that's, that's all we can really do is plant seeds and, you know, uh, those who are receptive, the Holy spirit will do his work uh, to bring to the point. And I mean, who knows how many people, you know, have been, this has been brought to their attention, completely rejected it. And at some point later, you know, they're going to see something that they really know well that all of a sudden changed and they're like, whoa. Yeah. Maybe what that person was telling me six months ago, there may be something to it. And then they're like you, Jason, or every, most everyone else, they jump on YouTube. They find one of these channels. So, yeah. you know, that that's our job to plant seeds and then, put it in the Holy Spirit's hand and, and let God take it from there. And at times we're the one that actually sees the harvest. Um, my wife and I prayed with someone just yesterday and um, we did a prayer in with her that lasted a couple of hours. And she's a believer operating at a really high level, just um, loves God. But we came to the realization in the prayer room, the Lord led us to the place where she did not know her value. You know, she was uh, along you know, along with a lot of believers, I think um, sometimes have struggle with just understanding their identity, understanding the power, the authority that they operate in as a as a child of God. So what was highlighted in that moment was um, that, that she there was a, a revelation for her to become aware of of who she was in Christ. And she got it like in that moment, the prayer that went, uh, um, I mean, she's bawling and she's like, how in the world have I missed this for the last 30 years? You know, that um, that I did not understand like the gravity of who I am and, and understand my value in Christ. So we got to pray for her and see her have that aha moment. And she kept saying, you know, like, wow, how did I not know this? Well, of course, there were plenty of people that, that prayed or, you know, have spoken into her life. There's plenty of seeds planted, but that was her moment. You know, that was her moment to really get it. And she walked out of here just a different person. Um, so I believe, you know, Holy Spirit is bringing people, you know, through a journey. And and if we get the opportunity to be the one that's that's actually sharing truth that they're getting, then, oh, my gosh, what an exciting experience. Love it. But right. sometimes, yeah, it's just planting um, seeds and not really seeing, you know, what's happening in that moment. But yeah, like Ernie's saying, maybe six months later, that is when it's happening. Right. So what did Paul say? Some plant and some water, but God adds the increase, right? Yes. Let's see if I can find that. First Corinthians 3, 6. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that gives the increase. Right. We all know that ultimately a salvation or, you know, having the veil lifted about Mandela is really uh, the, the, the purview of God alone. It is a sovereign event. That's right. That's <laughs> I cannot, right. Uh, I cannot uh, cause anything like that however as i said there is this we're co-laborers so there's a a passage where it says god confirmed this the word with signs following well if there was no word proclaimed in the first place then god would not come behind it and confirm it so it's just what you're saying though is so profound it's the whole aspect of dependence of, of not being self-directed in our in our efforts so we always remain humble and dependent upon the holy spirit knowing that it's ultimately him it's like i put my 
hand on the steering wheel. God puts his hand on top of mine, and it's really him steering, right? I'm just staying aware of that and staying open to the Holy Spirit. Lord, what are you saying? What are you saying? I remember the worship leader at the church where I was employed for like 10 years. It was a lady, Sister Gwen. She walked in a 24-7 connection with God. She was a Jedi Knight hearing from God. She was always like, you know, not like mystical or kooky or anything, but you could just see that she was always hooked up, man. And she knew, she just knew God. It was awesome. It was so awesome. So that's a great revelation, man. Package delivered for us to be able to do better at this. Yeah. And, you know, so you're just, I, I've, I've got one of these women in my life too. That's just amazing as far as like being in alignment with the spirit, being right on top of things. She's very accurate. And I just love being around her. You know, the Lord hasn't given me a green light to have this conversation with her. Mm. I've got, you know, several people that are just amazing people, but I still haven't had the conversation with them because I'm waiting on the Lord to say that one now. And I thought that I was getting the green light with her a couple of years ago and um, started having a little bit of a conversation with her. And then I, I realized real quick, the Lord was reeling me back in. Interesting. So, yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm sensitive to like when I'm sharing and who I'm sharing it to much more now than I was early on. Right. And what, a, what is your take on the, the few that see the changes but but then refuse to do anything about it with their congregation. Hmm. How do you think God views them? Well, <clears throat> you know, I, I can, the one pastor that I was speaking about that, you know, he saw it and then walked out and then he's saying, God, you know, like the Lord will take care of his word. He's no longer the pastor at that, um, at that church. And, you know, it was very interesting because all this happened before, the pandemic began and mm -hmm. we were very hopeful that he would um, navigate the pandemic better than he did. Mm -hmm. But he watched the church basically fold. Um, you know, we were ready to go back in. You know, we were not wanting to slow down for a minute. They were using, you know, my wife and I and a couple others that we were um, working with, we were doing altar ministry and they had given us access to like all kinds of things. We we saw God really moving in the um, in that church, and like fast forward six months into the pandemic, basically the church fell apart. Um, and then a lot of the people that were there went to another um, another church down the road, and um, we saw the pastor basically just um, fold up the tent and stop coming in. Um, he, he, the pressure was too much. He didn't take a stand. And I believe that if he had, had taken a stand earlier, you know, that, um, he would have been in a position so that the pandemic would not have phased him. But, yeah. you know, so, you know, that, that as far as pastors, not, acknowledging and moving forward, I think there is a cost here. You know, once they know the truth and then they deny, you know, what's going on, I, I, you know, they become accountable at that point, I believe. And Ernie, what's the status in your church? Because I know you brought this to your pastor and, or the elders, and it's been some time has passed and nothing's really happened, right? Well, I, I brought it to my pastor twice. Uh, initially, I brought it to him like, I don't know, a week after I saw the, th the the changes, expecting that I would just show him crazy words in the King James, like stuff and how, you know, the word has to be published into all the world and, you know, just things, yeah. you know, like wineskins and bottles, you know, just stuff that, you know, we all saw immediately and think that he's going to see this and, you know, we're going to start spreading this through the church. Of course, obviously, that didn't happen that way which is really the impetus for me to, to do all the research that I did. Cause I felt like I've, I've got to get Evans and, you know, prove and show to him, show this to him. So some time passed. Um, I was able to, uh, one of the elders is a real good friend of mine. I've known him for 
30 years. And I was able to share it with him and he saw it. And then uh, after my granddaughter had her accident and her miraculous recovery, um, when she told him her testimony of, you know, seeing Jesus when she was in the coma, well, then he went and told the, another elder that you need to talk to Ernie about this. And I showed him and he sees it. And of course, I went back to the pastor again and he remembered something. I mean, he was he was so middle of the road with this, you know. Yeah. So bottom line is, no, nothing has really happened. other than These two elders see it. My pastor doesn't really. And that's what I said earlier in, in the broadcast. And I'm disappointed that they haven't because they do see it and they are shepherds of the church, that they haven't done anything to move this forward, you know, to say to other elders, to try to tell them or, or tell other friends of theirs that are elders, hey, you need to talk to Ernie about this. So, yeah, it really hasn't hasn't moved. So then a lot of people find it very difficult to maintain church attendance when their pastor doesn't see the changes, especially if they've gone to the pastor like Ernie has twice and they're just kind of sidestepping it. What's your thoughts about that, Jason, if you have people that have basically left the church because of this? Because it's such a it's such a controversy in their soul. Because essentially they they're looking at this man of God who's a Jedi Knight level guy in the Bible and he can't even see this. So now I don't trust him. Uh, I, I'm, I'm suspect of the doctrine that might be coming at me. There's just this uh, constant offense that rises up in them when they put the scriptures on the screen, right? Or he, t he says, you know, you know what version of the Bible he's using, and you're in the same version, and they're, they're quoting the scripture, but when they say it, they say it the way they remember it. So they're real-time reinterpreting it. It's just, it's like so debilitating that people just i can't i can't reconcile all of this anymore these people either got to get real or i'm going to go out the door and find people that will walk in truth that's basically that was my mindset and i don't think i'm very different than a lot of people so how do you what would you say to that because the church is an important place for connection human connection we are sheep we are not created to be isolated alone wandering around where all the wolves are right so what's the answer well i think you said earlier um you know with if a pastor sees all the changes and starts preaching it from the pulpit then uh, there's going to be a lot of people that will just leave so but yes there's going to be a lot of people that will come there too um so at that church, you're going to basically have an audience for what you're preaching, you know, and that transition is, is going to be very difficult because yeah. <laughs> right. like, can you survive, you know, that many people walking out because it's bound to stir people up and to, and to do exactly what you're saying. No doubt. I mean, that's basically the horns of the dilemma that you're on church leader. If you're listening to this, and you know this is true, I'm I'm encouraging you to jump into the fringe of society trafficking in the dark corners of the internet where we are because we may be persecuted, but we're out here with Jesus. Jesus is the truth. And, and the facts mean things that are obvious. That's what the word means facts or i'm sorry truth has to do with facts and facts has to do with things that are obvious and what's obvious is jesus didn't tell people to have their heads chopped off jesus doesn't have female breasts there shouldn't be anybody in the bible any version saying that men are breastfeeding and david's getting an erection and god's shaving people's vaginas and he's masturbating and and all these terrible things, I'm, I can't even say them, but I, I have to try to prevail with you that this really is happening. And if you jump off into this, it will blow up your life. You'll probably lose your ministry. You might lose your family. However, read us Hebrews 11, the hall of faith. They were, they were wandering around. They were 
wandering around in sheepskins. They were, they were tortured. I mean, that's true Christianity, right? None of this business as usual stuff anymore. There is a great divide. There is a separation that is taking place right now with the wheat and the tares and the gray area between walking in truth in all spheres of life. Not just, I want to win souls. The Bible wins souls is this thick, okay? But my Bible is this thick. It covers all the spheres of life. And if you don't stop pretending that the moon landing was real and 9-11 was real and there's no such thing as chemtrails and all those people that say flat earth are kooks and all these people that tell the Bible changes are kooks. No, sir. We are not kooks. My advisory board is made up of, of engineers for energy companies, bank executives. One man flies helicopters, and he's rated to fly people with 20 people on his helicopter. Okay? These people are not kooks that are on my advisory board. And so what is happening is there is an end time sign and wonder that's happening right under your nose. And the reason that you don't want to see it is fourfold. Number one, you don't want to have to give up your ministry and be persecuted like we are. Number two, you have a, a pet doctrine that the Bible can't change, but there's not one scripture that says the Bible can't change. There's only passages that say the word will not change or God will not change. Then the third reason that you refuse to see this is another pet doctrine where you believe that the devil doesn't have this much power, but in all due respect, you don't know your Bible because it says he does over and over. I mean, remember when Daniel prayed and the angel Michael came to him, or Gabriel, whatever one it was, and he goes, look, I answered your prayer right away, but the, the prince of Persia withstood me 21 days. Is that right? For three weeks, this demon was duking it out with, well, apparently he's not a pushover. I think Michael's a pretty potent dude, and he couldn't get past this guy for three weeks. So Yeah, I'm saying that's a fallen angel, way above a demon. Thank you. Yes, indeed. So these demons and the Satan have... Uh, a lot of juice, right? I'm not, I'm not uh, glorifying Satan. That's a Christian, Christianese type of thing. Okay, I just go by the scripture. <laughs> Ultimately, it says, "Is this the man that caused nations to tremble?" He's a punk. He's nothing. But as he operates now, he's going to be given his time to rule. It says that God will give him power to wage war against the saints. Well, it is happening right now. The reason that the pre-trib rapture doctrine is so dangerous is because this sign and wonder that's actually taking place right now, you can't see it because you think that the, all the signs and wonders that you've talked about yourself from the pulpit aren't going to happen until you're raptured out of here. But... What if you're wrong on the pre-trib and it's actually post-trib and you're going to go through the trib and the trib is actually kicking off and these signs and wonders are kicking off, just like Amos said, that he gave us a celestial event that would happen to let us know that the Amos 8 prophecy was now triggered. The sun would be darkened for three to four hours in noonday. And guess what? That happened over Siberia and Europe. The sun was darkened in the middle of the day. It's all happening right now. And people like Jason and people like myself and people like Ernie are waving our arms. We're creating complex PowerPoints and videos. And we're coming to you and you're like the guy that came to the door when Peter came to the door and Rhoda came up there and Rhoda's like, oh my goodness, it's Peter. And she runs in and tells all the people in the prayer meeting who, by the way, were praying for Peter to come out of prison. And God answered your prayers, right? And the doors open automatically, his chains fall off and he walks out free. It's one of the most supernatural things in the whole New Testament. 
but the believers were unbelievers. And so he comes to the door. He's like, gee, thanks, guys, for praying for me. It worked. And Rhoda goes in, and they tell her, look it up. She goes, it's Peter. And they go, you're crazy. It says it right in the Bible. There's two ways to be deceived. Either you believe something that's true is not true, or you believe something that isn't true is true. And in that case, they were deceived, and they believed something that was true was not true. Okay? And that's what's happening with most church leaders. They believe that the Mandela effect, which is true, is not true, and then they're calling those who are telling them crazy. And you have to repent of this great evil and go to wakeuporelse.com or wake up or else on YouTube. This is not a plug. This is just so that you can shorten your learning curve and watch the doctrine of the preservation of Scripture in the light of the Mandela effect. Watch, did God warn us about this Mandela effect? Those are two 90-minute overviews that will walk you through all of the passages in the Bible that foretold this with in context. It'll give you all the background, and it will give you permission to open your mind to this, this is actually happening. And then you can jump on board with us. Because time's running out. That's for sure. Hey, John. Yes, sir. Speaking of time, we've been uh, three hours at this, brother. (laughs) I got to get up and go to work in the morning, so Uh, I'm going to have to check out. Got some stuff I need to do before bedtime. But uh, I appreciate it. Enjoyed being on with you guys. Me as well. Yeah, the next you, opportunity. Awesome. Jason, words. good seeing you again, brother. Great to see you, Ernie. All right. And I think I'm going to need to check out as well. Um, really appreciate being on. This has been quite a, um, a ride tonight. I've enjoyed it very much. Um, John, keep doing what you're doing, brother. It is, it is so refreshing to see someone speaking the truth and, um, And doing it in excellence. Uh, Your presentation, the way that you communicate is fantastic. And um, I'm just really glad to have been a part of this tonight. Awesome words, brother. Thank you, too. It was exactly what I was hoping for. We learned a lot, received an impartation, and just encouragement that it can work. And that, I think, was probably the biggest thing you were able to share with us is, you know, because a lot of people are discouraged. They're like, apathetic they like don't believe anybody can be convinced and you've broken the ceiling for us um tonight so this has really been awesome man thank you so much i've enjoyed it very much thank you very much all right. stay in touch right. jason love you all brother right. god bless I'll do it. all right, all right. Bye. yep oh wow 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 <laughs> amazing Absolutely, unequivocally amazing. Yeah, that was, for me, that was a really, like just a shot in the arm, you know, from the Lord, that this this message we're trying to carry can be carried with excellence. It can be carried, and people can hear and, and see. And, you know, Jason had a lot of wisdom and he brought he brought um, a great word for us and I believe we received an impartation to go out and tell the story thank you Lord yes it is humbling Cassandra that is for sure just incredible yeah, three hours just just zoom by. It's just unbelievable. So I am uh, I'm very grateful for this community. I think that uh, without all of you people, I just would be a mess. I mean, I'm already a hot mess without without you know any question. Um, so 
Ceiling fan man, I love you, brother. It's so great to see you. I'll never forget the first time that I saw you talk about the ceiling fan was used by NASA as an actual picture supposedly of a satellite, and it actually shows the little pull cord to turn the light on. <laughs> I mean, you got to know that they're doing that on purpose. They're not that dumb. You know, they put this stuff right in our faces, <clears throat> and they get duper's delight. You know, like when they show us the ISS and, and they we see the, the, the wires or we see the, the guy going by. There's one with the ISS where the blue screen didn't work, and you actually see the guy floating behind this other guy with the harness and the wires, full view. Well, I, I just don't believe that's an accident. They're showing that stuff on purpose because they believe we're so stupid that they can do that and still get away with it. And guess what? Looks like they were right. I mean, they named Pluto Pluto, and then they actually – create the face of Pluto on the surface of Pluto. They do stuff like that, just mocking us because we're so stupid. <laughs> That's right. I'm saying that word. That's for emphasis because it's getting late and I'm getting a little punchy. <laughs> but Ceiling Fan Man has a great channel. You guys got to go check him out. He's over there on YouTube. Ceiling Fan Man. And then, of course, you've got Mike in here somewhere. Where was Mike? Awakened Saint. There you are. And uh, Awakened Saint's really cool stuff, man. Mike's a good friend. I call Mike up and I cry over the phone to Mike sometimes. He just listens to me. <clears throat> I think Jesus told his disciples once, you've been with me in all my trials. So what are you going to do? Like one time, Tony Soprano in one of the episodes was like standing around and his mother just died. He didn't like his mother. So then all of his gangster buddies are like, hey, Tone, you know, I'm sorry for your loss. You know what I'm talking about. And Tony's like, what are you going to do? And then the other gangster says, Tony, yeah, you know, like, you know, she's she's in a better place, you know. And, and then Tony's like, yeah, what are you going to do? That's all he can say. <laughs> so I never forgot that. So I use that all the time now. If there's a problem, my answer is, what are you going to do? You like that? You could use that if you want. So here we are. We're in the afterglow. This is like when you go to church and you're in the afterglow. <laughs> Woo, baby. Jason brought the thunder. Jason brought the hammer down on telling the story of the Mandela effect. Foo wee. Hey, you know, next week I got uh, Bill Bean is coming back. Bill Bean is coming back for round two. We're going to get into it. And then I was having a little back and forth with uh, this. Um, oh, my mind. My mind is, I need a cheeseburger or something. I need something to eat. Uh, uh, Dolly, that's her name. Dolly is a brilliant Bible teacher and is brilliant, has all this really profound stuff. I'm trying to get her on here. Dolly, if you're listening, send me an email. Please wake up or else at gmail.com because we're going to get into um, punctuation. That's why I want to bring Dolly on. She's like a guru on punctuation. She knows all this stuff because, you know, as you know, the Bible, King James Bible, looks like it was written by a fifth grader. And, I mean, they used to use that at, in, in the one-room schoolhouses to teach the kids how to read English. And I've shown that to people like, oh, that's just the King James language. 
I'm like, if you say so. So what are you going to do? The Bible's changing. What are you going to do? You got to do something. Just don't get mad at God. One of the quintessential hallmarks of a true believer is they don't get mad at God for nothing. Think about it. You go to the mission field and you're in the jungle or you're living in the dung hut and then the guys come with the machetes. And I heard this testimony. This is a true testimony. I heard this from the front of the room from the missionaries. They came and got this family. This is this is heavy duty, okay? So just fasten your seatbelt. They bring the family out. They're Christians. And they chop the mother's arms off, and then they hack the baby in arms off, right? The reason they did that is so that the mother couldn't go comfort the baby because now she doesn't have any arms. True story. Their only, their only crime was they loved Jesus. So it is in those moments that your faith is truly tested if you will become bitter at God for allowing this thing to happen. Like let's say you were the the son that then ran away into the jungle and you got away. Now you live with this rea <coughs> this reality that God allowed your family to be killed, right? And now you hate God. And there's people listening to this transmission right now who are mad at God because when you were uh, young, maybe one of your parents died of cancer or some car accident. And in your little heart, you thought, why did you let that happen, God? And there was a little bitter root judgment that you chose to embrace into your heart at that moment, that you would not let God in because of what he had done. Or maybe you're like me. You went through terrible sexual abuse as a child, and you had alcoholic parents that neglected you like I did, and you formed these little force fields around your heart to keep out, you know, you had to do it in a way to survive, but as an adult, they don't serve you very well. And so you had these bitter root judgments that you wouldn't let anyone love you, so they can't hurt you. Well, Sort of works in the short term, but in, in the long term, your life is then characterized by superficial relationships and loneliness and depression. So it doesn't really work. So you have to let God in through forgiving yourself and forgiving others. And so the journey of truth that you're on, otherwise you wouldn't be here, really leads to one end point the source of all life, the source of all that is. The Bible says, everything that was made was made by him and for him. And apart from him, nothing that was made was made. That's pretty heavy. That's talking about Jesus Christ of Nazareth. All things that were made were made by him and for him, okay? And then just in case you didn't quite understand that, it states it again. And nothing that was made was made apart from him. Well, that includes you. So you were actually created by God, for God. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It is not yours, you are bought with a price. You are not your own. Therefore, glorify God in your body. It specifically says your body is not yours. It belongs to him. All souls are mine, saith the Lord. You're only on rental. You're only borrowing your body. And you have an expiration date on your forehead. 
And there will be a day when you'll draw your last breath and you'll leave the body and you'll launch into eternity. You go into eternity. And if, if the Bible is true, then there is an afterlife. There is a eternal existence of awareness. You don't go into annihilation, according to the Bible. Your soul, which is your mind, will, and your emotions, is attached to your spirit, and your spirit is eternal. And it goes out of the body into the dimension of eternity. And in that moment, all of your life's choices culminate in a judgment. Now, the good news is, it isn't, your destiny is not dependent on your goodness. Your goodness will never ring the bell. Your goodness will never satisfy the courts of heaven because a big rock goes to the bottom of the pond just like a little rock. So if you're a good person, you're not good enough. And actually, heaven isn't really for good people. It's for holy people. So unless you're holy, you don't have a, a chance, right? You're just clay. You're just a, a bag of water and chemicals. So the great picture of holiness is the tabernacle. God gave them all the directions of how to create this tent. It was a tent, and they built the materials according to his specs, and, uh, and they've got the rods of gopher wood and they got all this stuff and they made it exactly like he told them and then they stepped back now up to that moment all it was was a tent made of camel hair whatever they had to use or i don't know and then all of a sudden it goes from being a tent and this giant pillar of fire comes down <laughs> boom down into the middle of the tent and if that from that moment on it was now the holy of holies so one minute's a tent, and now all of a sudden it's the Holy of Holies, which, by the way, does not appear in any Bible translation anywhere in the Old Testament. The Bible no longer has the words Holy of Holies. So the only thing that makes a person holy is the presence of the Holy One. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is what makes you holy. And only Jesus Christ can prepare your vessel to be inhabited by the Holy Spirit through his substitutionary sacrifice. So you want to know how to get to heaven? All you got to do is there's like a little line in front of you, and you just step over the line and accept this gift that God has given through his Son. Okay, so all of the things that you've done, which you know are wrong, will be punished outside of Christ. If you're in Christ, he's like Noah's Ark, you go into the Ark, you'll be saved, then all of the punishment that you deserve went on him. It, it's a substitute. So you get, to, you get to skate, you get to walk free, but you have to receive the gift, okay? So there's all kinds of soap in the world, but if you don't go buy some, then you don't get, and then use it, you don't get clean. Okay, so Jesus died for every man, but not every man closes with Christ. So there's a step that you have to take in order to appropriate this cleansing blood. And it's very simple. You can read about it in the Bible. If you believe in the heart, Christ rose from the dead, and you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. So it's a heart thing, and it's an action thing. And you can do it any time of the day or night. You just have to say to Jesus, Lord, if this is real, I want what you got. God, if you're real, I ask you to come and help me to know Jesus. I want to know Jesus. I want to be saved. I want to go to heaven. I want to know what this whole thing about the Holy Spirit is about. I want to know the absolute truth. If Jesus is the truth, then I want to know Jesus because I'm a truther. Right? Are you a truther? 
Are you a truther that walks through this world without the source of all truth? Maybe God led you here tonight so that you could hear the ultimate truth. It's not a concept or an event or a thing. It's a person. The ultimate truth is a person. And it's not Buddha. It's not Hare Krishna. And it's not Muhammad. All of those religious leaders are still in the grave. Only Jesus Christ rose from the grave, proving that he is alone, the only way to God. And that's what he said. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. First Timothy, there is neither there is no other name given under heaven by which men must be saved, the name Jesus Christ. And so the dogmatic nature of the Bible is what it is. It's take it or leave it. There's no apologies. There's no exceptions. It's either the truth or it's a lie. It's not all little good teachings and you can live by No, it's Jesus is God in the flesh, and he's absolutely the only true religion. All other religions are false or he's a liar. And a lot of people try to straddle that. They, like Muslims try to accept Jesus as a prophet and a teacher. No. They have teaching on Jesus. And they pseudo-accept him, but they cut short of who he claimed to be. He claimed to be God. They tried to stone him because they, he said, before Abraham was, I am. Well, they knew what that meant. And they took up stones to stone him. Well, that's because he was claiming to be God. You haven't met love until you have opened your heart to the love, the lover of your soul. So, if that's you, if that is you, it's just as simple as somebody handing you a birthday present. Here. And then you can say, no thanks. I want to earn that. I'm going to go to work for you for a day, and then you can give it to me as wages. No, it's your birthday. You don't have to earn us. I bought it for you with my own money, and I want to bless you with it. Oh, okay. So you reach out, and you just take the gift, and you say, thank you. That's Jesus. Right? Say, Lord Jesus, if this is real, I ask you to forgive me of, your sin, of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart. I will repent of my sin, and I will walk with you all the days of my life. Amen. Something like that. And I've heard all the people tell me, oh, you can't blend people to the Lord with a prayer and the prayer. You know what? I researched that after people said that. And you know what I found? I went to the book of Acts and I watched them preach in the book of Acts. And you know what happened? There was no altar call. Okay. There was no sinner's prayer. They just they just preached so compellingly that the after they were done, the next thing says, and 3,000 were saved that day. <laughs> so they would just preach, and then the people would get saved. So I'm still working up to that. Maybe I'm like Babe Ruth. He struck out more times than anybody else, but he got more home runs. All right, so if you ever pray that prayer and you found Jesus, I want you to send me an email at pleasewakeuporelse at gmail.com because I want to talk to you. Send me your number, and we'll make sure that we figure out how you can walk through the Mandela effect with Jesus. There is a, a, a teaching on my YouTube channel that has that name. You should watch it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I give you praise, God. Thank you, Lord. Well, I'll tell you, you people, it is it is 10.20 p.m., and we are going to say goodnight. Will you stop talking, John? Just stop talking. <laughs> Woo! <sighs> All 
All right. Well, I'm going to have a live stream this week sometime. I'm not sure when because I had some things I was going to share tonight, but it's going to be probably Tuesday. I don't know, maybe tomorrow. I'll see. And then uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, be sure to join Cell Group or two. It's awesome. And uh, if you can, remember to donate in the links below because I am definitely living by faith here running this thing. It is awesome. Thank you for all those who donate it, uh, keeping me fed and I can like keep doing this. I'll probably have to go back to work unless things change, but that's fine. Whatever. I'm not worried about it. God's in control. He knows what time it is. And then, uh, what else? What else is there announcement wise? Next week is Bill Bean. And uh, be at peace with God and man. How's that? All right. Good night, everybody. Love you much. Talk to you real soon. Take care.